Unfound is a podcast that will be two years old at the end of this month. It has an interview-based format and concentrates more on facts than theories. Today I will take you back to the beginning, then right up to the present, as I cover updates on many of Unfound's cases. I'm Ed Denzel, and this is Unfound. Results, they are all that matter. As much as we talk about fair playing, playing by the rules, we all know that if we don't get results at work, at home, in our personal relationships, there will be problems. And we all know how we've uh, sometimes twisted things in our favor to get a desired outcome. Thankfully, most of the time, it's harmless. However, let's be clear, without results... All we're doing is talking with no purpose, going places with no purpose, and probably living a life with no purpose. Results need to be gotten for civilization to move forward. I bring this up because as host of Unfound, results are always on my mind. I've told many listeners privately that the goal of every episode of Unfound is to solve the case. Not to just talk about it, not to wax poetic, not just to show you how interesting or amazing or mysterious it is. And my belief is that every episode that doesn't lead to a case being solved is a failure. Yes, it's a high standard, but I'm a big boy. I can handle it. But really, if we're not here to get results when the topic are disappearances and suspected murders, then what are we really doing? So today we're talking results. What actually happened after Unfound's coverage? And now, a summary of Unfound. I'm going to give a shout-out to Megan Good and her site, charlieproject.org, even though I didn't need to use it for this particular episode. Unfound was born out of the idea that the public should know as much as it can about missing persons cases. I, as the host, go about getting you all the facts I can by interviewing those people who are closest to the case usually family members. However, we've also had bloggers, reporters, and private investigators on the program, but only one official law enforcement member, Detective Kenneth Maines. Why only one? Frankly, because cops, although they know a lot, they never want to tell you anything. And unlike many programs that splice in the host's questions and comments after, Unfound plays every interview as it was recorded. Minus the mistakes. The interviews are played in this manner because I believe you, the listeners, need to be reassured that nothing is taken out of context and that you are listening to a conversation like any two people might have. The first call I ever made representing myself as the host of Unfound was to Mary Lyle, mother of Suzanne Lyle. The call happened sometime in late July 2016. I was at my parents' place in Pennsylvania. I can remember standing in their bedroom with the door shut for privacy when I made the call. That's a true story. She surely had no idea who I was, and at that point I had no history of ever interviewing anybody. I can kind of rely on my extensive resume now. But at the time, I was just a guy on the other end of the phone line. I was very nervous. However, Mary couldn't have been friendlier. And I would say these days we talk about once every two months. And she has been very supportive of Unfound, I can't even begin to tell you. Sending several future guests my way. I hope to meet her in person sometime soon. That conversation was followed by a call to Patrick Marker, the guest for the Joshua Guimond episode. Then Tim Wright for the Ben Charles Padilla episode. And before I knew it, Unfound had gained some momentum. Probably the next big thing that happened for Unfound that pushed it forward was a listener kind of becoming my right-hand woman to find guests for the program. Emily, 
you've heard me mention her many times before, is responsible for finding probably half the guests you've heard on Unfound since May of 2017. Her passion and compassion make her excellent at what she does. She stays in contact with guests even after they've been on the program. Then, in December 2017, Unfound became linked with the Tribune Review in Pittsburgh. It carries Unfound on its website, and I help them cover older missing persons cases in western Pennsylvania through monthly articles. That continues to this day. And along the way, up to the present, there have been books, and the Unfound podcast discussion group, and the newsletters, and the Unfound Facebook page, and probably my favorite time of the week, Unfound Live on Wednesday nights. The first almost two years of Unfound have gone by very fast. There is no guest for this episode. For once, I'll be doing all the talking. I'm Ed Densel. I'm from Leechburg, Pennsylvania. I attended Grove City College, class of 93, and graduated with a degree in business, a degree I have never had to use in 25 years. <clears throat> I lived in Las Vegas from 1998 to 2011, and I now live in Madeira Beach, Florida. But Vegas is still my favorite city. Unfound news. I'm in Pennsylvania. It's good to be here. And I'll be here until sometime in August, probably around the 8th or 9th. Don't worry, the unfound work will continue, but possibly to a little lesser degree. My parents really need their time with sun time. Next, two new Facebook pages have been set up for recent unfound cases, Julie Early and Amanda Fravel. There were no pages for either case before unfound's coverage. A couple listeners, in coordination with the guests for those episodes, have taken on the task and I can't thank them enough for getting involved and being so proactive. I ask you nicely to like those pages, follow them, and share them. Finally, did I mention that Volume 4 is out? It covers the disappearances of Eric Franks, Jeff Joseph, Donna Mikolenko, the Marco Island Three, Claudia Wells, and the McDaniel Sisters. Please find it on Amazon in both ebook and print forms. Thank you. Where you can find Unfound. Unfound is on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, iTunes, Podomatic, Stitcher, Podbean, and Spotify. In particular, check out the Unfound live show on Facebook on Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern. You can email the program unfoundpodcast at gmail.com, the website unfoundpodcast.com. Please check out the secret Stephen Kocher episode. The website at Trib Total Media, triblive.com forward slash news forward slash unfound. Unfound has Patreon and PayPal accounts. Your contributions provide for many of the items guests have received so far cannot thank all of Unfound supporters enough. Unfound Merchandise, Volumes 1, 2, 3, and the previously mentioned Volume 4, on Amazon in both paperback and ebook form. Let's try to work on getting some great reviews for all of the volumes. If you've bought them, please give them a nice review. The Playing Cards, go to makeplayingcards.com forward slash sell forward slash unfound podcast. Search for almost all of Unfound's cases at unfound-podcast.myshopify.com. This includes the flagship t-shirt, The First Year Cases, that is a collage of everyone from Suzanne Lyle to Jennifer Wilkerson on it. And yes, there will be a shirt for the second year cases. And please mention Unfound on all true crime Facebook pages and other websites and forums. Thank you. Before I start these updates... I need you to realize there will be many cases that aren't mentioned. This could be for a variety of reasons. Nothing, unfortunately, has gone on in the case since Unfound covered it. Or things have happened, but I'm not at liberty to talk about them. Or I don't want to tip off those suspects who may be in law enforcement sites. Or many other combinations of factors. Please do not assume anything in particular if you do not hear a case mentioned. I should also add that some of these updates are going to be longer than others, depending if there's some sort of backstory that I think I need to add so you can all understand what happened. Just keep that in mind. We will start with Suzanne Lyle and work our way to the present. Suzanne Lyle, that episode came out in early 
September 2016. At the end of October of 2016, so less than two months later, I got an email from a guy who said that he knew Suzanne Lyle and Richard Condon way back in 1994. In fact, he was there when they first met. If you'll remember that Richard Condon was Suzanne's boyfriend at the time that they disappeared. Well, already in Unfound's existence, not even two months in, I was already getting crank emails, people saying they know things, it's, and that continues to this day. And I, that's why I still to this day continue to be very cynical about information that I get. I don't believe it at face value. So I was like, all right, man, what do you got? Just kind of that attitude. And this guy, and I'm not going to say his name, and I know that he listens to the program to this day because I've gotten to know him uh, fairly well. And I want you to know he, was a, he is a good guy. Good guy. But he was able to, I think, flesh out some more information about Richard and Suzanne's relationship at the time. And then he moved away, and it was after he moved away from the Albany, New York area, is when Suzanne disappeared. And so after a while, I was sure that he he was who he said he was. And I was passing this information, I eventually passed this information on to uh, Mary Lyle. Of course, of course, she was very interested. And then eventually, this guy and Mary got to talk. And as I remember it, as I sit here now in July 2018, I think that she even kind of remembered him from way back when. And they got to talk. And he said enough that the state police of New York actually spoke to him over the phone. I don't think that they actually ever did end up going down there to talk to him in person. But that's really all I want to say about that. He told me uh, some other information, but I don't think I want to release this right at this time. But it was the first circumstance where an episode had been out there like I said, a month and a half. And of course, at the beginning, not a lot of listeners, just like any podcast is at the beginning, or any show for that matter. And somebody actually heard it and responded and new information that could be added to what was already known, like new information. And that was a real mind blower for me, I have to admit. Uh, it was what I was trying to do. That was the intention of the show from the beginning. And that this guy came forward uh, to tell me about what he knew, it made me believe that, you know what, I think I'm doing this the right way. I think this is the way to go. And it really reinforced my belief on how to cover all of these cases. Now, in his case, is the way I remember it, once in a while he would get online and see if there was any new information regarding Suzanne's disappearance. And this is going to be a little bit of the theme as we go through all of these cases that sometimes people don't even know that an episode came out about, for example, Suzanne Lau until many months or a year or even longer after it came out. And that's what's so good about the Internet, I guess, is that once you put something out there, it never goes away. And I talk to this guy even to this day once in a while. I'm not mentioning his name, not even his first name. But he's a good guy, and he was just looking around, and he came across Unfound's episode of Suzanne Lyle, listened to it, of course heard my interview with Mary, and decided to come forward. Of course, the case is still unsolved. It's now over 20 years since Suzanne disappeared. But my hope is, of course, with Suzanne's case and all of these cases, is that as long as they're out there, there is hope that somebody is going to hear something in one of these episodes and it's going to spark a memory, whether it's with her case eight years, uh, 20 years ago or 40 years ago for other cases or 10 years ago, whatever the case may be. The next case is Ben Charles Padilla's, and I have to admit that since airing that episode, I'm still not sure if his last name is pronounced Padilla or Padilla. I'm just going to be honest with you. Tim Wright my guest for that episode 
said Padilla. He's the one that met the family uh, back when he was writing that uh, article that he did. It is still the best article about the disappearance of the 727 from Angola, Africa, back in 2003. Ben Charles Padilla, or Padilla, being in the jet when it took off and disappeared. But here's what happened with that episode, and this, like I said, was a little creepy. I have the ability with my Podomatic subscription to see where people are listening to the program. That's just not in the United States, but it's all over the world. And as you can imagine, as Unfound has gotten more popular, there's more countries, more cities in other countries uh, that have tuned in. And it may even be people who listen to Unfound go on vacation to Europe, and then, of course, that's where it shows that the episode was downloaded. I had already uploaded that episode once back in September. But the mix wasn't good. I was still learning how to figure out the recording on a phone. I went through like four different phone apps before I found one at the beginning. And then I ended up not, I ended up not liking that one. And I had to get another one in 2017. Once again, experimenting with like three or four. And now the one that I found maybe in February, March of 2017 is still the one I use to this day. So I went back and re-edited it, and what I mean re-edit is that I messed around with the audio levels, so Tim was a lot louder and I was a lot softer. Still, once again, you can hear like the air conditioning in my apartment in the background, and these, once again, growing pains of a program. And what happened was after I uploaded it the second time, Sometime in November, I went and checked where people were listening to Unfound. And what I found was that before that episode, I had no listeners on the continent of Africa. None. And then after that episode, suddenly I was getting a bunch of downloads from Somalia and Kenya. And I thought that was interesting, and I watched it for a few days, and I figured out that whoever was in those countries was downloading the Ben Charles Padilla episode. And I'm just going to say Padilla for the rest of this part of the conversation because that's the last name that was used in the interview. Suddenly I had all these, not a ton of downloads or anything, but more than you would expect from a missing persons program Granted, Ben Charles Badilla disappeared in Africa. But I ended up getting in contact with Tim Wright again. And I told him about this. And this really piqued his interest because the rumor out there is this one of these countries is exactly where the plane was to have gone if it was stolen. And the belief is that it was stolen... So it could be used to uh, ferry drugs from Africa into the Middle East. And of course, those two countries are on the east side of Africa, very close to the Middle East. Or, or it was going to be used to go in to take um, slave labor back and forth between the Middle East and Africa. It's rumors. Or it might have ended up in the ocean or crashed. But I continue to believe to this day that that plane was stolen and landed somewhere else. So that was a little creepy, knowing that probably the people who had something to do with the taking of the jet happened upon, found out about this episode that went so in-depth about the theft of this jet and were now tuning in to Unfound. That's the only thing that makes sense, and I've had a long uh, chance to think about this for a long time. That's what happened. Once again, just like... With Suzanne's case, finding out the power of the internet, the, finding out the power of covering a case in the right way. And so what happened after that, I told Tim about this, and he contacted somebody, and then one day, I'm going to say it was in December 2017, or 16, December 2016, I had a Skype call with Tim, and a guy who 
would only give his first name, and I don't even think that that was his real first name. Tim, to this day, has not told me who the guy was. But he seemed to know a lot about a lot. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. And he wanted all the details of what I uh, happened upon, the statistics, when the episode came out, and who was downloading, and the country, downloading in the countries. Now, you should also know that at the time, just to see how strange this was, I contacted a very, I'm not going to give the name, a very, very popular, what you could call true crime uh, podcast. Very popular. Very popular, to this day, popular, way popular. And I asked one of the hosts, not to give it away, um, if they had any listeners in Africa. Now keep in mind, Unfound Small, this podcast, the podcast, huge. This person got back to me and told me that they have no listeners in Africa. And, they, and it's a very, very, once again, very popular podcast. So here I am with a very small audience at the time. This other podcast with a huge audience, I have listeners in Africa and they don't. That once again let me know that somebody who probably had something to do with the stealing of that jet was tuning into the program to figure out maybe if um, you know, we we're going to talk any more about it, if it revealed anything, if they needed to watch uh, themselves or whatever else, but, you know, talking, uh, to on the Skype with Tim and this guy and him, like I said, to this day, I still don't know his real name. He wanted to know everything that I knew. I tried to work with Podomatic to try to get the IP addresses of where these people uh, were listening to the program and downloading. I was not able to do that. Maybe I should try again. Maybe they have the technology now. Maybe I should look into that. But that was what happened, uh, and I've really not, nothing's happened with that particular case since then, but once again, it showed you the power of the internet and um, knowing that somebody out there is listening and keeping an eye on you to the point where it could be people who stole a jet. The next case is Kelly Rothwell. Uh, if you'll remember, Lee Clifton was the guest for that episode, not a family member. She runs the site TampaBayCrimeReport.com. I finally got to meet Lee, I'm going to say about four months ago, even though she doesn't live that far from me. We're both very busy people, but we got to meet about uh, four months ago at a local Starbucks and talked for a while. It was good. And... Uh, David Perry, you should know, the guy that is the main suspect in Kelly Rothwell's disappearance is back in jail. And I would urge you right now to go to Tampa Bay Crime Report to find out the latest on that. But she uh, continues to be very zealous in her pursuit of him and trying to figure out what he did with Kelly after what he believes she believes he mur after he murdered her. Uh, we've talked about a lot of different theories, a lot of different possibilities of where she could be, and um, hopefully someday we'll get to go after those possibilities. Right now, just not possible, I don't think. But uh, Lee continues to be harassed, maybe not by him, but friends of his, his family. Of course, during the episode way back then in September, October of 2016, she talked about being hacked and people impersonating her online. I don't know if a lot of that has gone on since that episode, but David Perry uh, did something that Lee was was Lee was up on, and it ended up uh, he got his probation uh, revoked for other bad things that he had done. And so I believe as of me recording this on July 8th, 2018, that he is in jail. But I don't know if the disappearance of Kelly Rothwell is any closer to being solved. The next episode that I can talk about, and once again, starting from the beginning of Unfound and working our way to July of 2018, is the disappearance of Donnie Smatlack. 
I got to meet his parents last summer. I guess it would be August of 2017. I met them down in the Irwin area at Eaton Park, which is a local uh, chain of restaurants, local chain. It's not a national chain in the Western PA area. It's very popular. And we sat there, and we must have talked, I'm thinking, for like three hours about all sorts of different things. And, of course, I'm originally from Western Pennsylvania, so we have a lot of that in common. Um, and talking about the Pirates and the Steelers and whatever else was going on. And, of course, we talked about Donnie's case as well. Now, what you should know is before that happened, and once again, this is, I said before how in the case of Suzanne Lau, it took about a month and a half before the guy who contacted me contacted me and told me what he knew. Well, Donnie's case came out in uh, October, November 2017, or 16, 2016. I'm going to say in June of 2017, so like six months later, over six months, seven, eight months later, I get an email. And it's from a guy who claims that he knew Donnie back in the day. And I ended up actually talking to this guy on the phone. Seems like a good guy. Now, he'll admit he wasn't always a good guy. But uh, one time he used to run around with Donnie a little bit, and they were doing some things that they probably shouldn't be doing. And um, what changed was that this guy, one night, once again, before Donnie disappeared, he came back to his apartment, And somebody, somehow, a guy had gotten into his apartment without breaking in. And when this guy popped on the light in his apartment, the guy was sitting there on the couch with a gun. And I believe this. I've checked this guy's story. Um, Donnie Smith, Lex Parks, know this guy. Uh, I've checked him out. I I will tell you he's on Facebook, but I'm not giving you his name. Uh, But I, I, I trust this guy's story. I believe this. And the guy was looking for money, and the guy was uh, a drug dealer. And this guy thought that he had gotten stiffed and everything, and he had threatened the guy that called me with a gun. And it was that that eventually caused this guy to get out of what he was doing with Donnie and other people at the time. And I'm going to say this is probably back in like 2003, 2004, something like that. He ended up getting out of town. His parent, He told his parents about it. They shipped him out, and that's when he began to ter- turn his life around. And now today, uh, I believe you know the guy's married. He has children. I think he's a good father, etc. But he was on a very dangerous path back then. And I think that when I talked to him, we had several emails back and forth, as I remember. And then he, uh, I called him, and we talked on the phone. I'm going to guess for an hour and a half, something like that, really in detail about what was going on. This guy was pretty sure, pretty, pretty sure that Donnie's girlfriend at the time that he disappeared had something to do with his disappearance. He's pretty sure about that. Now, you should know regarding Donnie's girlfriend at the time, since Donnie disappeared, she got married and her husband died of a drug overdose last year. So she is still in her 30s and has gone through three men. I think the guy before her died somehow, before Donnie died somehow, then Donnie disappeared, and then her current husband is of 2016-2017, um, he overdosed. And I think this happened not long before this guy contacted me. So that was part of it. All right, so we talked a lot about that. Um... And he also led me to believe that Donnie was a little bit bigger of a drug dealer than was led on during the episode. Okay. Now, after that, if you can believe it, so we go, now that was like May, June 2017. Back in February, so February of 2018, something like that, another guy, or maybe March, another guy contacted me. And he could add in some things that uh, 
the other guy couldn't, that maybe he didn't know about. And once again, these, I don't know if, the, I never mention people's names. I never give up sources, okay? You know that. So neither of them know that each contacted me unless they know each other and told them they were, I, and I don't think that's the case. I think that I didn't bring up the first guy's name to the second guy and I didn't bring up the second guy's name to the first guy after the second guy called. It's just not what I do. I don't think that's good journalism. Uh, so this guy contacted me and he was able to fill in. If you'll go back and listen to that episode, and by the way, if you are new to the program and I'm talking about some of these cases you've never heard of, you should probably go back and listen to them first and then come back to this episode. Just a suggestion. It'll make more sense to you. But um, if you'll remember from the interview that I did with Linda, Donnie's mother, she talked about how there was a scuffle. She came in one day and something was going on in the basement where Donnie had his little hangout and everything. And something was going on and she kind of went down the stairs with what was going on. As soon as she did that, this other guy ran out of the house. You you can go back. Trust me. You'll go back. You'll hear it. Well, this guy, who, the second guy who contacted me, once again, February, March of 2017 or 18, 2018, told me that what Mrs. Smatlack interrupted was a robbery. And in fact, had she not come down there, probably Donnie would have been robbed again. This guy had done it before. This guy had been over to the Smatlack house before and robbed Donnie and got away with some money. I'll just leave it at that. And then the guy decided to come back again. Linda Smatlack heard what was going on, went downstairs. The guy got scared and he took off. And I'm just going to leave it at that. He told me the rest of the story. Let suffice to say that this guy who committed the robbery, he's still alive to my knowledge. But there were some of the things that went on after that that we'll just leave it at that. But it's not believed that this guy who robbed Donnie once and then tried to do it again was involved in Donnie's disappearance. It's just tough to say. But what this second guy did tell me was that Donnie was definitely involved in dealing drugs outside of the Pittsburgh area. That's why he never had any charges against him, never got caught or anything. He didn't sell locally unless it was to people he really, really knew, and then he sold it in very small quantities. He was more interested in the big picture and wanted to be a little bigger than just the guy dealing on the corner, and I think he was. Now, it should also be known that the reason, this guy told me, the reason Donnie even moved out from his parents' house was because of that second robbery attempt. That he thought that he was getting his family, his parents, and his brother too close to the business that he was doing. It was getting dangerous, mainly because of all the money that was involved. So, that's why he moved out and got his own place. Now, what's interesting about that is that when he disappeared and they went over to his place, they didn't find any money or any, you know, there were drugs that fi were found there. I don't think that that's private, but there was no money found there. So it is believed that whoever caused Donnie Smatlack to disappear also got all the money that he had in his place. But I reiterate that the belief this guy told me, and I asked him about Donnie's girlfriend. He's also very suspicious of her. And this is another guy who used to run with Donnie and then once again got out of the business too. And once again, I've looked him up. And he's on he's on Facebook too. I've looked him up. He kind of got on the right path eventually. But he also thought that Donnie's girlfriend could be involved. And But he insists that... Um, that uh, this was done by people outside of the Pittsburgh area, outside of western Pennsylvania. There was what they call a New York connection, and then there was an Ohio connection that Donnie allegedly had. Uh, he believes that some of those people caused Donnie to disappear for whatever reason. Uh, on top of the reason, possibly, that his girlfriend, Donnie's girlfriend, 
went to rehab, but then as soon as she got out, she went back to use, and it could be that she was using his drugs that he was supposed to be marketing, and that got him in trouble with some people. A possibility. So, once again, about eight months after the episode came out, one guy contacted me, and then about a year and a half, or maybe a year and four months after the episode came out, another guy contacted me. Once again, under the same circumstances, seeing if anything was going on with Donnie Smatlack's case, and then found the program, listened to it, and then he contacted me. Mm -hmm. And in both cases, uh, I passed the information along, and I'm leaving some things out. You should know... I'll talk about as much as I think I can, but I'm just going to leave it at that. Um, But I've asked these both of these guys to contact uh, Linda and Donnie's father uh, specifically, and just go talk to them. And you know, and that's the way I prefer. If these people know things, I I appreciate them contacting me. I, I I have to admit I like to know these things, but I prefer if they just go directly to whoever my guest is. If they know the guest, just go talk to them. Stop by, call them up, email them, whatever you got to do. And I I told, uh, of course, I recommended to Linda that she needed to pass all the information that these two guys said on to the police, but Donnie's disappearance is still unsolved. There's one other thing. I should go back to the first guy that called me or talked, emailed me, and then we talked on the phone. That it's interesting that the guy that Donnie was allegedly going to see that Saturday in a place called Delmont, a place that I've been through many, many times, actually has a connection to Oakland, Pittsburgh, the Oakland section of Pittsburgh, which is where the University of Pittsburgh is. Well, that was where Donnie's car was found. So there's that. So that's what's gone on since Unfound covered Donnie Smatlack's disappearance. The next case I'm going to cover very shortly is Andrea Bowman's. Uh, after the episode, Kathy Turcani had, had uh, sent, sent me a shirt with Andrea Bowman's, uh, her daughter's picture on it, her biological daughter's picture on it, and I wear it every once in a while for the Unfound Live show. In fact, I think I wore it just this past Wednesday, like five days ago. She ended up getting the detective on Andrea's case to listen to the episode. And I think that Kathy led me to believe that it really helped. And that's what I would recommend to any guests on the program is that the good thing about an interview, the way Unfound does it, is it condenses all the facts into a very tight package. You know, you don't have to go through files and files of paper or anything else. Uh, I ask the questions... The guest answers them, and it's very easy to understand. And Kathy at the time led me to believe that this really helped. Now, I don't think a lot has been going on in Andrea's disappearance, but I was led to believe by Kathy, once again by Kathy, that uh, it certainly kind of refocused the, the people who were supposed to be working on the case. Uh, but you should know that Dennis Bowman... Uh, who she believes, and I'm inclined to believe, caused Andrea to disappear, is still a free man, still lives on the same piece of land up there. And um, I don't know if, I don't think, at least I haven't heard, whether he's been called in front of a grand jury or anything like that. But that's a case that uh, is open, but I I think an unfound case Uh, that Kathy was able to use the interview as a tool to get the detective's attention, that's great. Uh, I think that that's, I don't know how often that's been done by people. It seems to me it's been done by more than once, but Andre Bowman's case is the one that jumps out to me as one where the interview was used like that. So um, I appreciate Kathy uh, using the episode, and I continue to be of any service to her or the detectives in the case. If they want to talk to me about the interview or, or anything, um, I'm ready to talk to them anytime. And I'm obviously I'm ready to talk to law enforcement anytime uh, if they want to talk to me about a case I've covered. But I just know I'm not interested in having them on the show because they don't say anything. The next case is Robin Abrams. I don't know. Um, 
if Unfound had has had much of an effect on this case. But this is just a straight update that if you don't know, that in April of 2017, uh, a basement was dug up. A guy who was associated with Tony Marquez, who is one of the main suspects in Robin's Abrams' disappearance, you will remember that he and Robin had a relationship, but he was a married man. And when she found out about it, she broke up with him. And then they, he and other men were harassing her. And then and some of them were police officers. And she filed a sexual harassment suit against them. She got fired. And then I should say she filed the suit. And it was during the course of the trial was going to be happening eventually that she disappeared. She drove her car somewhere, and then she disappeared, and then her car was found later. And she's never been seen again. Well, basement was dug up in April of 2017. Nothing was found. And um, on top of that, what happened was that uh, the podcast Generation Y covered the case in June 2017, and I was so happy that they mentioned that I helped them cover that case by getting uh, them in touch with Jody Walsh, who is Robin Abrams' sister, who was the guest on Unfound uh, for that episode. Uh, Robin Abrams' case, uh, probably one of the better known ones, I think, that Unfound has covered. But I don't know that after whether Unfound, when Unfound covered it or when Generation Y covered it, I don't know how much has moved forward, but that's the update. That uh, a basement was dug up for some reason. They found nothing. Uh, I don't know what to make of that, but that's the update on Robin Abrams' case. The next case I want to talk about is Christopher Hyde's. I don't have any updates for you, but sometimes unfound serves as a way to kind of put a case on the map. I mean, to that point, the way I, I think I understand things, Christopher Hyde was probably the most unknown of all of the cases that Unfounded covered. Now, granted, by that time, I mean, we'd only done maybe 12 or something like that. His disappearance was featured in Volume 2 of the Unfound book series. His sister Lila was my guest on that episode. What we managed to do with that case is that we got it on charlieproject.org, which it wasn't on there before. In fact, now that I think about it, I don't even know if Christopher Hyde's disappearance was even on NamUs at the time. And I, I, I think it is, or I know it is now. But we were able to kind of just straighten, straighten out the facts. There were some things that got, I think, misconstrued over the years about where he was seen and and the places that he went to down in Bradenton and Sarasota. And if nothing else, that disappearance is now clear in everybody's mind. I still am not sure what happened there. I will tell you that every once in a while I check a website for any unidentified remains in Florida, just in case. And I can tell you right now of the unidentified remains in Florida, there are none that fit Christopher Hyde's description so you know it's been like 15 years since he disappeared he could still be homeless he could still be out there and I'm I'm hoping that that is the case I'm hoping that some way he can be found but at least in that case we were able to get everything on the record sort out some of the facts that weren't facts and get him on Charlie Project and really raise the visibility of that case so more people know about it, if nothing else. And sometimes that's the best you can do. Sometimes there aren't going to be people who come forward with new information, like in Donnie Smatlack's case, for example. So that's not always going to happen. But if we can at least get the right information out there, you know, and twist all these, like it's like an information pretzel sometimes. You look at the information, you just think, how did this get so distorted over the years? How did this happen? And so Unfound tries to correct the record as it covers the case, not just t 
talk about a case. And I think that a good example of that would have been Christopher Hyde's that now after Unfound covered it. It's on NamUs, on Charlie Project. And now if somebody goes to any of those places, they know actually what happened. In contrast to before, it was very foggy. The next case was interesting. This was, um, I guess, the second time you could say that Unfound went international, the first one being uh, Ben Charles Padilla's disappearance. Jeff Nichols, he disappeared uh, from Salt Lake City, Utah. If you go back and listen to that episode, you'll find that the main suspects are his ex-wife and at least her father. He went to meet her about picking up some golf clubs. Of course, the story is she says he never showed up. And his truck was found a few days later, and he's not been seen since. And if you also remember, his ex-wife, Jeff Nichols' ex-wife, their son, and her parents fled the United States six, eight months later, something like that. And she was up on charges, all sorts of fraud. I mean, her entire family is very shady. Well, I found out that she that uh, she went to Ireland. Well, it just so happens that uh, I got an Irish listener involved in this case. And this listener uh, has gotten to be uh, probably un- one of Unfound's longtime listeners. I think she's been here with the, the program since almost the beginning. And um, she was able, and you know, I got talking to her about it back at the time. And, you know, not she's, a, she's not in law enforcement or anything like that, but she was able to, I think, pull a couple strings here and there to find out if Jeff, Jeff Nichols' uh, ex-wife and her parents have gotten into any trouble while they've been living in Ireland. And the answer that came back was, no, it doesn't seem so, unless they're using aliases, which we found out eventually, I think it's in the episode, that his ex-wife was using an alias. What was also interesting, though, is that we found out that they were involved in a church in Dublin, Ireland, that eventually went out of business. And at the time that it went out of business, Jeff's ex-wife was running its bookstore. Yes, really. It was one of these mega churches. Uh, I'd had a school attached to it or something, but somehow it went under, I guess it wasn't getting enough donations. But it went out of business, and it just happened to be that at least... Jeff Nichols' ex-wife was working there. I have no idea what that family is doing now. Uh, I Every once in a while, it's been a while though, that I will ask my friend in Ireland if she could check into something, if their names have popped up. Uh, but nothing has. Nothing has. But um, Let's just say that Unfound continues to have their eye on Jeff Nichols' ex-wife and her parents. And of course, his son, you know, it's been, what, 14 years, I think? Was it 2004 that this happened? It's been quite a few years. You know, this kid's, um, just wonder how much he really knows about his father these days, I wonder. I really, really uh, wonder about that. So after that, the update on that one would be that we discovered that this church went out of business and she was the the librarian such slash bookstore manager. And then it they've kind of lost contact with them after that. The next case I want to cover on this update episode is James Walker. Now to my knowledge, and you should know that uh, Bobby, his son, who was the guest on the episode, is a big-time follower of Unfound. Uh, I think he tunes in almost every Wednesday night um, for the live show. I talk to him once in a while. I'm going to guess that he never even heard of Unfound maybe before we did the episode. And In fact, I think back to it now, I think that Bobby actually contacted me if he's listening right now, he, he probably rem- knows uh, one way or the other. But he's a good guy. I've kept in contact with him, and I always love seeing his name on the list on Wednesday nights when I do the live show. 
What happened, and uh, this is fairly recently, I'm going to guess back in April, it must have been, so about four months ago, April 2018, I get a message, not in my messenger box, but over on the inbox for the Unfound page, Unfound Facebook page. And this guy does not have very nice things to say about Unfound. Guy's calling me a liar and some other choice words being that this is PG rated. I can't use the words. And what I found out was that the guy who contacted me, his name is Ronald Adams. And he is the son of Donald Adams, who was with James Walker the morning that James disappeared. If you'll go back once again, if you haven't listened to that episode, go back and listen to it. James was was allegedly with Ronald Adams and two other people, another man and a woman. And what Bobby and I talked about in his interview is that their stories just don't quite make sense. And I'm not going to go into all the facts. If I was to go into all the facts of all these these cases, again, uh, this episode would be like 10 hours long, and I don't want to do that. But if you go back and check the facts, the story about the case, you'll see that they don't make sense. Well, this son, Ronald, did not like the way his father, Donald, can't make that up. Donald is a father, Ronald's a son, can't make that up. Um, didn't like the way that Donald was portrayed. And after I got by, you know, just calming him down and telling, hey, I want to talk to you, and that's the truth, was did not... I did not lie to him, try to egg him on, nothing. I did not try to troll him, anything. I just simply told him, you know, let's talk. What do you got to say? I'm willing to listen. You just tell me what you want to say, and we can talk about it. And did not ever claim that it was going to be private. And so anybody who's been listening to the, watch the live show and and some of the other things I do maybe on the discussion group know that this happened. That we had this discussion, and you know, he called me a liar, and I just asked him, you know, you listen to the episode, you tell me where Bobby lied or that I lied, anything. You tell me. Couldn't do it. All he said was that there's no way that my father would have ever done anything to James Walker. They were so close. He used to spend holidays over at our place. Well. That, as a person who's become, I guess, an unlicensed missing persons expert, that those kind of relationships don't mean anything to me. To me, it even makes it more probable that somebody did something when they say, oh, how close friends we were. So, he's going on and on about this, and I'm listening to him. And I told him, whatever you want to tell me, I will tell my listeners, and I will put it in the next book. Because at the time, I was working on Volume 3, and if you go to Volume 3, you will see it. I, I kept my word. But at no time, at no point did he ever say that we lied. Never disputed the facts at all. He gave an excuse of why his father left the scene and then came back. Nothing that could ever be proven. But he never said that we lied. And he claimed he tried to point the finger at somebody else, and I've talked to Bobby about that, and Bobby totally, totally dismisses that. So after a while, and you should know that this kid who is now um, 32 was only 14 at the time. I'm not going to say that Ronald Adams knows anything about the disappearance of James Walker. I, I don't believe that. There was nothing in our conversation that would lead me to believe that at all, for the record. And I'd tell that to his face. Um, On the other hand, um, he didn't do anything to dissuade me from thinking that his father had something to do with the disappearance. In what capacity, I don't know. But I think Donald Adams does know what happened to James Walker. Now, what ended up happening there was I think that the guy just got frustrated with me because I think that he was expecting me to, you know, fire back with some F-bombs and everything else, and that's not the way it happened. And I tried to have a conversation with him, and then that frustrated him, and then he started calling me names again, and then I had to block him. So that's what happened. 
And that was my first circumstance in, and like I said, that happened just very recently in April 2018. But that was my first time where a family member didn't like how they were portrayed. I, I, given how many suspects we've called out on Unfound, I would have expected it to happen a lot sooner than April 2018. I mean, it's like a year and a half later, um, considering the size of the audience. But that's just kind of the way it went. And so I got my first angry suspect family member in April 2018. The next case I'm going to cover is Teresa Butler's. Teresa Butler, uh, you have to understand, that was a case that I wanted to cover from the first time that it came into my head that I wanted to do Unfound and the way I was going to do it. It's a disappearance that... Um, still, you know, frustrates me all these years later and approximately a year and, I don't know, five months since Unfound covered it. But there have been some things that have gone on. Probably most importantly, and this was, uh, you know, the, you find out the hard way in doing some of these cases that there is information that the police have that the public doesn't. And there'll be another case uh, we cover eventually here where uh, we find out that as well. In Teresa Butler's case, what was discovered after Amy Lacey, who was a friend of Teresa's, and I did that interview, and I think this information came out, I think it was still in 2017, but late 2017, that shortly after Teresa disappeared, her camera was found. It was found in a ditch somewhere. I'm not sure how close to her house but one of the items that was stolen was found. And on top of that, I think maybe around the same time, it seems to me, there was actually a, a, a dig that went on in a field not too far from where Teresa disappeared. And of course, she disappeared at her house. I have to say at the time that I was not too hopeful just didn't find it believable that uh, they were going to find anything. It was so close to the house. I was thinking probably that area had already been searched at some time. I just didn't seem, it just seemed to me that they were just doing something to make it look like they were doing something. It's really the feeling uh, that, that I got. And it must have been the case because because they didn't find anything. Now probably, uh, and I should go back to this the camera for a second, the camera revealed nothing. It did not help them uh, in getting any closer. At least, once again, they, the camera's been out there. They've had it since she disappeared. And the case is still unsolved. So, obviously, the camera didn't help in any way. But it was something that I think would have been interesting to talk about with Amy had either she or I known that. But we didn't. So, if you listen to that episode, and then you find out, you know, you decide, well, why didn't they talk about the camera? Because that's now common knowledge. It's because at the time of the interview, we didn't know about it. Now, probably the biggest deal, and it's very, very sad, that happened since Unfound covered Teresa's disappearance, is that her husband, Dale, her husband at the time of her disappearance, committed suicide on the anniversary this year in 2018 of her disappearance. I don't know. I know that's something that I talked about on the Unfound Live show back at the time. I know I posted about it in the group. A lot of people talked about it, wondering what that meant. But if you're unaware of that, if you're new to the program or just missed it, uh, and I don't know if I mentioned it in an episode around that time. I don't remember. But he committed suicide. Now, what does that mean? I, I don't know. Um, does he? You know, some people are going to believe he had guilt uh, because he did something to Teresa and he couldn't live with it anymore. I guess you could look at it that way, or you could look at it as he committed suicide because he couldn't live without her. He really missed her, didn't do anything to her, and really, really missed her. And, of course, uh, he's always been seen as a suspect, even though... I think they proved that he was away at work in a, in a totally different state, like an hour and a half away or something like that. And there was no way that he could have come home 
and caused his wife to disappear and nobody and anybody at the company that he worked for not noticed that. So I'm not sure what to make of it. And we don't know all the other issues that Dale might have had going on in his life. We just don't know. It might not have anything to do with her disappearance at all. Being that it was done on the anniversary, I guess it would. But um, I don't know. It just depends on how you view the disappearance. Me personally, I do not believe that uh, Dale had anything to do with Teresa's disappearance. Uh, mainly because, uh, going back to the interview, I don't know if we talked about this or not, but I'm going to say it, is that allegedly Dale's car was seen by somebody in the driveway that night that Teresa disappeared, even though he was supposed to be at work. The problem, the person who saw this, I consider to be a suspect in her disappearance because of information that I've learned about this person that I can't talk about. So... But yes, the camera was found. There was a dig not too far from her house. I remember it as being in 2017. Maybe it was early this year, 2018. But I remember it as being last year. And then finally, Dale, her husband, committed suicide on the anniversary of her disappearance in 2018. And that would have been about six months ago. The next update I'm going to give you is on Eric Frank's case. Now you should know... There's nothing, to my knowledge, really to update with the case itself. It's still unsolved. Uh, we still don't know if Kendra really died or not. Allegedly, she had cancer. And once again, if this some of these things you don't understand, uh, I urge you to go back and listen to those episodes that I'm talking about on this update episode. But Eric Frank's case started the intersection between unfound and disappeared. I want you to know that I never cover any episodes, I cover any disappearances on unfound because disappeared did it. That that doesn't happen. Yes, we've covered some of the same cases, but that is not on purpose. And in fact, you know that um, unfound tries to cover a lot of cases that have never been on any program anywhere. Whereas I think other programs, other podcasts, they only want to cover the well-known ones because it's easier to market them. And yes, I truly believe that. I do believe that. I really don't care about the marketing side of these cases. That never occurs to me at all. Somebody wants to talk to me, we'll talk. and We'll see if we can make an episode out of it and inform the public. But this was a case where... Joanne, his mother, had already done the interview with Disappeared, but the episode hadn't come out yet. And so that interview came out in March, and then in, I think it was May of 2017, the Disappeared episode came out. And I think it was the first time that, as the audience was growing of Unfound, that people finally figured out that Unfound covers cases more in depth than Disappeared does. Even though I know that disappears very popular i would urge anybody any family has a chance to go on that program to do it even though that i have a lot of complaints about it which i'm going to get into a little later um they should have an opportunity to do that just understand that if you're going to go on that program you're going to get interviewed by three hours for three hours by one of the producers and then they're only going to use about five minutes of the talk that's the way it goes with tv of course, Unfound went more in depth than Disappeared did. Uh, I guess one of the advantages is that I don't have a time limit. I don't have to get everything done in an hour. If it takes three hours, that's what it's going to take. And I know that Eric Frank's episode, as I remember, it was fairly long. What was kind of interesting about it was that the title of that episode, Unfound's episode, was The One Who Got Away. A disappeared titled their episode, The One That Got Away. Now, proper English is who, because you're talking about a person, not a topic. Uh, so, actually, I used proper English, although I think that's kind of funny that we came so close. I independently came up with that title, and to this day, I wonder if they knew about Unfound's episode and then said, well, we can't just outright copy them, so we're going to change it, just one word. 
that still runs through my head to this day. The next case that I want to offer an update on, a very short one, is on Donna Mikolenko's case. You should know that uh, Dr. Eric Grabowski, who was the interview for that episode, he was the guest and he was in contact with Donna's family. I actually got to meet him, if you'll remember, going back to that episode. He's from Western Pennsylvania. I'm from Western Pennsylvania, although neither of us live anywhere near there anymore. But we got to meet in August of 2017. In fact, it was the same day that I met the Smatlacks. In fact, um, I met the Smatlacks first at the Eaton Park. And we had like lunch or something. We were there for three hours. And then uh, Eric came in after that. It just ran one into the other. And uh, Eric and the Smatlacks never met each other. So I spent that whole day in an Eaton Park in Pennsylvania, technically in Irwin. So that was kind of funny. But we uh, talked about a lot of uh, different things uh, outside of the case. But since the interview. He has actually gotten to speak. He reached the guy who was with Donna on the night that she disappeared. Of course, that type of person is always going to be considered a person of interest, a suspect in any disappearance. Just makes sense. But Eric has gotten to talk to him. Of course, the guy denies knowing anything. I think the two got along just fine. Uh, But also, my impression is that Not much has gone on with the case, and I think that you should know that Eric's uh, a professor, very, very um, busy guy, and um, I don't know if he's gotten done done as much as he would have liked to in 2017 regarding that case, and even into 2018. Uh, I think that he has uh, looked in some different issues up there in North Dakota regarding her disappearance, but I am left with the impression that um, maybe he hasn't been able to do as much as he'd like, but at least he tracked down the guy who was with Donna that night and now knows how to reach him. So that's the update on that case. You should know something before I go any further, that I'm not using uh, a script to do this. Maybe you can already tell because I'm slipping in some you knows and uhs every once in a while. All I have up on the screen in front of me are just a few sentences about what happened. And that is enough for me to remember um, what I want to talk about. Uh, I thought, the reason I'm doing it this way is because I thought if I'm going to read a script, and it was probably going to take, I mean this episode is probably going to end up being at least two hours long or something, I don't think you want to listen to me read a script for two hours. I don't think, I I mean, I know that books on uh, audio, audio books and things are very popular, but this is a little bit different than that. And I thought just doing this off the top of my head and having a very conversational style would uh, be a little better than me just rattling stuff off. In any case, uh, I'm going to go to the next uh, case. And that is the Marco Island 3, which is a name that I came up with for the disappearances of Omar Shear, Kent Monroe, and David Madot. David's father, Bill Madot, was the guest. And those two episodes were a little bit experimental. Yes, it was a two-parter. First week, uh, I played the first half of the interview. And after I presented the defense of why Jeff Wandich, the guy who survived, didn't cause their disappearance. And then the next week, after the second part of the interview, I listed all the reasons why he could have done it. I personally do believe that Jeff Wandich caused the disappearance of those three guys. I I don't know if it was necessarily intentional or not, and I'm going to get to that in a moment. But I do not believe his story for a second. I don't believe it. Now, what's interesting about that is that many of you do believe him. Now, I think the overall consensus is that, okay, maybe a couple of the facts aren't right here and there. Maybe he's just so traumatized and everything. But um, this is one of those cases where my opinion on what happened is very different from a majority 
of the listeners' opinions. And I have to say I was very surprised about that because I thought I did a really, really good job in that second episode showing why Jeff Wanditch's story didn't make any sense. And you all rejected me. I'm still trying not to take it personally. Ha ha. Now, what did happen was that... hmm, I really can't remember how long it was after the episode came out, but it wasn't long, maybe a couple months. Maybe, let's say, May of 2017. I got an email, and I can't tell you who it's from. I know who the person is, but I'm not going to tell you who it is, but it's in a, a, a person in a position to know the three young men who disappeared and to know Jeff Wanditch. All I can tell you, it was not uh, Bill and Dot who sent me this email. But somebody sent me an email from Canada because all of these four guys were Canadian that said that Jeff Wanditch, I have no proof of this, Okay, but allegedly, allegedly, with capital letters I have it in my notes, Jeff Wandich had done this before on a lake in Canada, meaning he was out on a lake with some people, I don't know, skiing, swimming, whatever, and he, quote-unquote, jokingly got in the boat and left them stranded out in the middle of the lake. Allegedly. I don't know. All I can tell you is this. The person who sent this to me um, is a believable person. He would be in a position to know. That's all I can really say. Um, it could be that he's just making this stuff up to make Jeff Wandich look guilty, really, really guilty, like he has a, a modus operandi or something. That happens, and I, this is not the only case where that's really happened, uh, where that kind of thing's happened. But I don't know what to make of that. I haven't, frankly, I haven't taken the time to look into that anymore. I told Bill Madot about it, and my impression that was that he was, uh, didn't know what to think either. I'll just put it nicely. So... It is interesting, though, that I got this email. That that if that was true, that would be very, very damning information. And um, anybody new to the program from Canada, if you knew Bill Madot or Bill Madot, Dave Madot, Kent Monroe, Omar Shear, Jeff Wandich, and if you've ever heard a story like that, I'd like to hear more about it. I really would. If we could find the names of those people who got stranded in the lake. I guess they were friends. I do not believe that any of those people were the three guys that went missing. They think they were different people. On my impression, there were some women involved in this case. So I would really like, if you've ever heard a story like that, or a party to that, please contact me at unfoundpodcast at gmail.com. I'd like to talk to you more about that. But that's an email I received a couple months after the Marco Island 3 uh, episode. The next case I want to cover, and and just very shortly, once again, a a short story, because the next case that I'm going to talk about after this one is going to be one of the longer parts of this episode. Claudia Wells. uh, Robin, her daughter, was on... The episode. This episode came out in late March, early May, sometime in May of 2017. Once again, we're working our way from the oldest to the newest. And just a few months ago, Robin, somebody allegedly thought they had found Robin's mother, Claudia, in LA, and she went down there to find out. I don't know the exa- all the exact details, and I, even if I did, I don't know if I could uh, voice all of them. But being that she did a couple videos on it on her Facebook page, I think that I can talk about this. And I want you to know that I've only in passing talked to Robin about it. Um, But she went down to L.A. and once again, uh, the person who was there, the older woman who was homeless, was not her mother. And I got the feeling that maybe this was part of a scam. I don't know that for a fact. Uh, All I can tell you is in watching 
what I did of the videos that she did, it just seemed to me that maybe it all wasn't on the up and up. And uh, I don't know what to think about that case right now because I have to tell you that as of now, once again, as of July 8th, 2018, I'm working on another case uh, that's similar where the woman disappeared and there were sightings of her that the family believes. And... I don't know what to think about sightings. You know what the statistics are about eyewitness accounts. Very uh, unbelievable. The the credibility eyewitness accounts are the flimsiest of all facts. If you can even call them facts. And I know, of course, you can go back and listen to that episode. You can go through the story with uh, me interviewing Robin and everything that she's gone through trying to find her mother. Uh, But it just seems that in these types of cases, and there's a lot of scams out there, and I've had to deal with them with people calling me former guests and people who aren't even guests yet emailing me, telling me about things, and I have to tell these people this is a scam. It's probably one of the toughest parts of my job is telling these people this isn't real. Those people who are telling you that they have your daughter and if you give them five thousand dollars, they'll give her back. And that's happened. That's happened. Um, I have to tell these people it's a scam. And that's that's very because I hope all of these people are alive. All the cases that unfound is covered. The people who went missing. I hope they're all alive, and I hope they're all found alive. Um, but. If it when you really learn very quickly, if it sounds too good to be true in a missing persons case, it is. And with Claudia Wells' case, um, I'm just not sure what to think about it. I just don't know. All I know is since the uh, episode came out, and I, once again, I believe April 2017, uh, it's unsolved. Robin went down to L.A. It didn't pan out. Up until recently, this next case, I would have called the one that Unfound had the most effect on. And that is the disappearance of Peggy and Patty McDaniel. You have to understand that when I came across this case, and the way I found out about it was through Mary Lyle. I can remember where I was sitting in my apartment when she called me. I was sitting in my leather chair at my desk. And I saw that she was trying to reach me and picked up the phone. We talked for a while. And then she told me about this case, about two sisters who had disappeared. And then as she's talking to me, I'm typing, trying to find the case online. And then I discover that there is a murder that's connected to the disappearance. And I was, I told her, how have I never heard about this case? And... She introduced me to Joyce Rivetuzzo, who I've become very close to. Joyce, one of I, I, I just, I'm just going to be honest with this. One of my favorite guests on Unfound. Uh, one of my favorite people that I've met since I started the program. And I can remember looking all over the internet. You know, like we all do. In many ways, I'm just like you finding only a picture of one of the daughters, and the only real news I could find on it was a Reddit post that wasn't even accurate, as it turns out. So we covered the case, and once again, if you haven't heard it, go back and listen to it. And we're very fortunate that a listener took a real interest in it and contacted Joyce, and they've been working together ever since to raise the profile of the disappearance of these two girls in 1979 down in the Fort Lauderdale, Lauder Hill, Pompano Beach area. Uh, they managed to locate Marvin Warren, who is a suspect in the case. He's still alive, and guess where he lives? Right here in St. Uh, right down the road from me in St. Petersburg, Florida. Yes, really. He has a Facebook account. You can go find it. And once again, you have to remember, when I came across the case, 
There was hardly anything on the internet. I urge you to do a search for them now. You will find many pictures of them. Of course, find the episode on them. You'll find all sorts of information, and it's accurate. You'll find that their Charlie Project pages are a lot more detailed now than they were a year and a half ago. And on top of that, uh, Joyce was able to actually start some dialogue with the police up in Live Oak where her two daughters were living at the time. And then also down in the area where they disappeared, where they were taken by Ed Gross and Marvin Warren. And I believe those are the two men who, um, who probably murdered them. And Joyce knows that uh, my suspicion is that those two girls were killed because they were witnesses to the murder. I think that Ed Gross and Marvin Warren used those two uh, 17-year-olds and lured the guy who was murdered there as they were trying, these two guys were trying to pimp them out. Guy shows up with the money and they murder him and take his money. That's what I believe happened. Ed Gross is not alive anymore. Like I said, Marvin Warren lives in St. Petersburg, Florida. You should know that this listener of mine was able to contact Marvin Warren. Of course, he denies everything. But the the um, profile of this case is a lot higher than it was before Unfound covered it. And it was to the point where that episode came out, I believe, in April of 2017. By December of this past year, to, uh, 2017, on the Missing Children's Day for Florida, there were, I think, eight or ten children missing disappearances that were featured for Florida, and Peggy and McPa- uh, Peggy and Patty McDaniel were two of them. And I'm not trying to pat myself on the back or anything, but without Unfound's coverage and then a listener really getting interested in uh, the case and wanting to help out and everything, that does not happen. Um, Joyce Rivetuzo has gotten to meet a lot of people who have the potential to help her, something that never would have happened if Mary Lau hadn't called me, if she, we hadn't covered the case as in-depth as we did on the episode, and then a listener took it upon herself to take it even further. Uh, it's really amazing. It's still amazing to me to this day. And like I said, up until recently, I would have called that the case that I've had, that Unfound has had the most impact on, simply because of kind of bringing it out of the shadows, where now people can Google that disappearance and they actually find information. And they can see who these girls were and learn more about them, because like I said, a year and a half ago, if you would have done that, you wouldn't have found the pictures of both the girls. You would have only found one. And uh, I know Joyce, uh, I, I don't think, couldn't be more pleased. But I don't know right at this point how close it is to being solved. And I don't think Joyce knows either. But there's surely much more going on now than there was at the beginning of 2017. So we'll just have to see. We have to remember this is a disappearance that is 39 years old. One of the oldest cases that Unfound is covered. So to be able to raise the profile of something that's 39 years old, it was really something. And and I met, if you don't know, I went up to Tallahassee back in December, and I met Joyce in person and her husband, and we had lunch together, and there was a ceremony there, and I was sitting there, and they got to walk up with a police officer, and you know their, their daughters, uh, Joyce's daughters were named, and... Uh, I'm pretty sure that in all these ceremonies and things they've had over Florida for missing persons, I don't know if Peggy and Pandy McDaniel have ever been mentioned before. So uh, that's considerable uh, for bringing something back to life 39 years. Once again, it's not all me. It was Mary calling me and then a listener uh, taking a deep interest in it. it. all We all have to work together on this. Um, But up until recently, like I said, it's probably the biggest impact Unfound has had on a case. Now, uh, in fact, you probably know what the case is that um, 
that Unfound had the most impact on, and that impact is still happening right now every hour, I think. But we'll get to that towards the end of the program. So Peggy and Patty McDaniel, uh, that disappearance, and uh, it's been such a pleasure for me to get to know Joyce, just a fantastic person. She calls me just out of the blue once in a while. I love it. I can talk to her anytime. The next case is Brandy Wells. The way I remember it is that after we had already done the episode, her mother, Ellen Tant, uh, sent me a video, a, a, a DVD, and it is an extended version of the video, I'm, I'm going to guess it's on YouTube and elsewhere, of Brandy coming into that um, bar, it was a country-themed bar, Texas bar, and then leaving. I have, she sent me an extended version of that. And what I was able to tell her after watching the video is that there is no doubt in my mind, This, and once again, I believe this happened after the episode came out, that there is no doubt that Brandy Wells left that bar with the guy in the white cowboy hat. There's no doubt. See, you know, the biggest problem I have about videotape is they only usually show the public a very, very, very small snippet, as if that's the only thing the public needs to see. Now, I realize, you know, in a newscast, they can't show an hour of video. I get it. But if you're going to cover a case like this, you need to look everything in context. If you just see that little short clip of her, you know, just a couple seconds before she leaves and then just to, to playing to a couple seconds after she and the guy in the white hat uh, go out of the picture, you could still kind of believe that they aren't together. But once you see maybe like 10 minutes before they leave and then 10 minutes after they leave, all of it put together, you see a pattern. And what I saw in watching it is when you see people leaving that bar, they go two directions. Either they go straight out or they curve to the left. Maybe maybe just a few, 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 maybe stand there around the door. Maybe a few stand to the right, but mostly they go straight out or they curve to the left. What Brandy does is what no other person does walking out of that bar in that time frame of the video that Ellen sent to me. She starts walking straight, then turns her head, then goes to the left. In that 20 minute or however long it is that she gave to me, she is the only person leaving the bar that does that. And there are many people who leave the bar in that video the clip that I have. She is the only one that shows that pattern of going out, going straight, and then suddenly veering to the left. Everybody else either goes directly to the left or keeps going straight. Once you play that video over and over and over and see all of that, you can easily tell that, whereas she veers like that, whereas the guy in the white hat goes directly to the left. Once you watch that enough times, you know that what happened was this. Brandy was leaving with that guy in the white hat. She was headed to her car. And it's obvious to me that he says something to her and she turns. And then she suddenly realizes, oh, we're not walking over to my car. He wants me to come over to his car. And that's why she turns. There is no doubt in my mind that that guy in the white hat is responsible for Brandy Wells' disappearance. The problem is, is that you never see his face on the video at the end. And the extended video I was given from Ellen that shows uh, Brandy leaving or entering, getting there that night, does not show him. I continue to believe that, you know, somebody had to splice that video together. Uh, my understanding is that the bar, which is not in business now, gave up that video and gave it to a news station and that's how it eventually got spliced into the 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 DVD that I have somewhere so, somewhere in Texas I still believe is the entire night 
from that bar, and I believe it is at one of the news stations in Texas. It may be buried somewhere in some basement, in a cardboard box, or whatever. I believe that video exists simply because I know that the bar did not edit the video that I have. The only way it could have been edited the way I got it from Ellen is if somebody had it on a machine, edited it down, and there's no way that bar would have taken the time to do that. They probably, they, I think they just said, here's the disc, take it. Take the computer, just make copy of the whole thing, get it back to us or something. No way that they would have, there's no way the bar would, I'm saying, would have gone through the entire video looking for Brandy Walls, getting there and then leaving. There's no way they would have done that. I'm telling you the full night of that video exists, uh, but it hasn't been found yet, but I believe it does. So that's the update. Uh, the update for that would be I got to watch the video and I, even more than ever, guy in the white hat, if you ever see the video, uh, did it. No doubt in my mind. Next, Clashindra Hall. I had her mother, Laurel Hall, on the episode. What happened after that episode uh, came out was I really don't remember how long it was after that. This would have been getting now toward the end of April 2017 into May 2017. And I think that Clashindra Hall started a... This was right around the time that Emily started working for me. Or she doesn't work for me. Uh, frankly, she's a volunteer. I don't mind saying that she volunteers her time to do this for the program. Um, but she takes cues from me about cases and what I think, you know, about you know, should I contact this person? You know, I give her advice on that. But uh, I think this started a string of Arkansas cases. Uh, and I, that's when uh, Emily came up. She's originally from Arkansas and takes a great interest in disappearances there. And that's how she came on board with Unfound. But after that episode came out, I don't know if it was a month later, a couple months, it was sometime during the summer last year, a listener came forward to say that, and uh, so I don't know if Laurel didn't know this, I didn't know this, but if you remember in that episode, we talk about Dr. Larry Amos and Clashindra working for him, and then she left and she never made it home. And we talk about his wife, and we talk about how he has... At the time, in 1994, I mean, this it's hard to have to remember this. This parent's 20-some years old now. But he had a very young son at the time. I think I remember it as being four or five years old. Well, Dr. Larry Amos in 1994 was not a spring chicken. You know, he wasn't like, you know, if you have a four-year-old, maybe you're going to be, if the guy maybe 30 years old, 35 years old. Well, he was much older than that. That should have been a clue to me just never occurred to me, and I thought, well, maybe Laurel would have brought that up, but I don't think she knew. Turns out that Dr. Larry Amos has an older son, had an older son at the time, who in 1994 would have been about Clashindra's age. It was a listener of mine that alerted me to this. And you should know his name is Omar with two R's, O-M-A-R-R. And guess what? Yep, he has a criminal record. It's just, uh, you know, it's one of those things. This is one of those facts that pops up after the fact and you think, man, how did I miss that? How did we miss that? And when I let uh, Laurel know about this, I think even when I sent her the information, I think I might have even asked her, did you know this? I don't think that she did. I do not think that she knew that Dr. Larry Amos has an older son. It's funny, it's never come up. And so I gave her the information on that. And I, it's, it's been about a year, it's probably over a year now since I gave her that information. I'm guessing it's gone nowhere. But I'm not sure, I think, I don't know, I, I'm pretty sure that Omar was not living with his father at the time. He might have been living with his mother. I've kind of thought was it possible that Clashindra and Omar ran into each other before became friends maybe they were a thing and was it he who offered to take her home that night pick her up drive around the corner maybe you know 
It certainly certainly doesn't help that he has a criminal record. I forget what the charge is on, but I'm sure all of you are going to look and find that now. Once again, Omar Amos, O-M-A-R-R, and then last name A-O, or A-M-O-S. So that's an update on that case. Just once again, just wish we could have talked about that in depth during the episode. I hate missing facts like that. That really bothers me, but that's the truth. Next case. Brandon Williams. Uh, I've gotten to know the guest from that episode, Stormy Dorsey, pretty well. Um, I've not had a chance to meet her in person, but um, you know, we end up talking once in a while uh, through Messenger. And she actually sent me a refrigerator magnet, uh, a picture of Brandon, uh, one of the ways that they've been using to get the word out about his disappearance, and it's on my refrigerator right now. And uh, you should also know that uh, one of the listeners uh, paid for a book that uh, I sent to Stormy. It must have been maybe the beginning of this year. In Brandon's case, after the fact... As Stormy was going through all of the information, she found a phone number. And if you'll remember, Brandon uh, was on his way on, on the Greyhound bus from Salt Lake City to Key West. He was going back down there to live with his um, boyfriend, whose name was Larry Green. And Larry Green claims that when Brandon got to... Nashville, he got off the off the bus and used a phone to call him in Key West to tell him when he was going to be there, when to pick him up. Well, at some point after Brandon disappeared, Larry actually told Stormy what the number was. It's pretty it's a pretty helpful piece of uh, information. And she gave it to me, and I was able to track it down. And would you believe that at one time that number was being used at a building in Nashville, Tennessee, that I would say is just a couple blocks from where the Greyhound bus station is. That's true. And I was able to figure out who had that phone number at, the, at this law firm. Now the problem is this. This is where it gets interesting. That the lawyer who had that number was assigned to his office, but he wasn't there anymore. And in fact, Stormy got to talk to him, and I got to talk to him. And, and I believe the guy. I, I, he's a, I'm not going to give you his name, but it seems like an fine upstanding person and he says I don't even remember that phone number but if I were the phone number was attached to his office in some way but then what I found out is that you know and plus he didn't even live in Nashville Tennessee when the disappearance happened so he ended up giving uh, Stormy the name of a woman who was another lawyer who also worked in the same building, and she might know something, and Stormy passed along to me, and I finally got a hold of her, had a good conversation with her. Couldn't um, help out too much, but she wanted to, because she, she knew, you know, I told her about the disappearance, and she, I think that she would like for it to be solved as well, but she couldn't offer much. She gave me the number of the guy who was responsible for all of their IT um, stuff, both computers and phones, uh, in that law firm building at the time. And unfortunately, he couldn't help out much either. And he said it's very possible that you know, the guy who had the phone number, it, he goes, I don't know, I don't remember if that, no, I don't, he, first of all, the guy did not remember the phone number, of course. And he didn't know if it was reassigned or or what, he just couldn't remember. And he says all of that information from when I worked there is long gone, unfortunately. But 
I should say that that guy's name is Charles Green, not Larry Green. I just saw that in my notes here. His name is Charles Green. And I have actually called that phone number. It is a spam phone number now. It does. Uh, now, the other part about this was is really, it's hard to understand if this was the number that Brandon actually called from, is that Brandon was in Nashville, Tennessee on a Saturday, into a Saturday evening. That's when the bus got there. Now, how could he have called from a number that was assigned to a law firm when surely a law firm would not be open on a Saturday night? Don't know. I I don't, I still don't have an answer to that. As I sit here on July 8th, 2018, I don't have an answer for you. So, you know, there's been suspicions that maybe, you know, he did make it down the whole way down to Key West and Charles Green did something to him. But, you know, Charles gave out this phone number. I mean, what did he do? Just did he go into the, did he just happen to pick out a number that was actually assigned to a law firm that was just down the street from the Greyhound bus station? That's a little bit of a stretch to me. A little bit of a stretch. So I don't know what to think. Now, even more recently, and Stormy knows this because I told her, uh, I was reading an article. There was a writer recently who died, and he once did uh, a story about, for an article, he rode a Greyhound bus cross-country just to see what it was like. And it's considered one of the best articles that he's ever written. And in it, he did detail that Greyhound buses are a great way to get drugs if you're into drugs. And unfortunately, Brandon Williams had did have a drug history. And I'm wondering if maybe he did buy some drugs on the Greyhound bus and left the station, went somewhere to do them, and overdosed or something. That kind of brought that back into focus when I read that article. So since then, once again, we have the this phone number that Charles Green claims uh, Brandon called from. But we've not yet been able to... It's very much like the most recent Amanda Fravel case where you have a phone number and haven't been able to exactly track that one down yet either, but I'll get to that case when we get to it. So that's Brandon, Brandon Williams' case, and you also know that uh, Stormy has been in... Uh, had a couple conversations with Kenneth Kenneth Maines from ASOC as well. I'm hoping they want to get involved in Brandon Williams' disappearance because I think it is one that can be solved. The next case, now we're getting toward uh, summer 2017. Man, it seems like, once again, it seems like I just covered this case yesterday. Craig Freer. It's probably one of the, you know, I don't like to necessarily call give cases uh, superlatives or anything like that, but it is surely toward the top of one of those stumper cases that all he had to do was walk from where he was at that girl's apartment um, back to his place, and somewhere in there, something happened. Um, Two notable things have happened since... uh, Craig disappeared. I think maybe one Unfound had to do something, at least with one of them. First of all, Craig's father has died. Uh, we didn't um, talk about his father too much during the episode. Veronica, actually even in our conversations off the air, did not talk about him a lot. And um, the only time we did talk about him was during the course of the the interview when she said that he went over, drove over to where Craig allegedly was, and he saw his car there, but Craig never came down from the apartment and just, of course, disappeared right right then. Hard to understand, and I I will be honest, that um, some listeners wonder if that's exactly what happened. So there's that. Um, the other big, uh, update on this case is that there is now a private investigator who is looking into it, um, and he 
contacted me early on and wanted to, as I remember it, listen to the episode um, and uh, get a little more information um, about the case because I think that he's actually had a problem. He's has a, I think he's doing this on his own. He certainly wasn't hired for, for, by Veronica because I don't think he and Veronica have ever spoken. So, but he lives up in the area, has got interested in it, and now he's trying to go back through everything and figure out what happened. He also started a Facebook page for all all of it, and I have to tell you that it's generated some interesting conversation. Um, but I, there is a part of me that maybe believes that he got interested because he heard that Unfounded covered the case. I think that's a possibility. So there is now someone independently looking at what happened to Craig Freer. And uh, I've had some conversations with this guy. I cannot, I'm going to tell you what we talked about, but um, he's certainly looking at everything. Certainly looking at all possibilities. And um, there's even uh, been some, some points that are brought up that maybe... Everything that, you know, a couple of things that Veronica said in the interview aren't exactly true. I'm not saying she is lying. Um, but she might have had gotten a couple facts incorrect. And especially regarding that party that Craig was at, that allegedly he was on the phone saying something, how could you do this to me? There's something regarding that uh, that isn't in the timeline. It's not exactly what Veronica explained. And I would urge you all to, to become part of the Craig Freer, uh, Facebook page, the finding Craig Freer. And you can catch up on some of those points there. Once again, it's a stumper of a case. Chad Campbell. I've only gotten, how many guests have I gotten to meet now? I got to meet Lee Clifton, because she lives near here, uh, but she's not a family member. I got to meet the Smatlacks when I was up in Pennsylvania. I got to meet Joyce Rivetuzzo in Tallahassee back in December. I've already uh, told you about that. The other guest that I've gotten to meet is Lisa Kassoon, the sister of Chip Campbell. She and I, and her husband and her sister, she has two sisters named Donna. I'm not going to get into that in this episode. But one of her sisters named Donna has also been there, and we've had a nice time. They come down here, and uh, we get together at this pizza place. Well, we get pizza. It's not exactly a pizza place, but we always get pizza when we go there. And we just talk. We talk about... And there's just um, some things about this case I can't talk about right now. There's been a lot of things that uh, have happened since. Uh, The one point I can talk about is that Tanya, Chip's former roommate, and a a woman that Chip was interested in being, you know, her boyfriend, but she was into drugs. And once again, you listen to the episode, she's talked about a lot. After the episode aired, she was found. I forget how soon it was. It seems to me it was within a couple months afterwards. and um, She was found in California. And one of the listeners, a listener in Australia of all places, was able to track her down using the multiple Facebook pages, Facebook accounts that Tanya was using. And so then the, uh, I know it would be the sheriffs, the marshals showed up, being that she's wanted um, on felonies here in Florida. Nothing having to do with Chip's disappearance, though. And they got her, and she is now back here in Florida, and she is behind bars. I don't know exactly what is going on with her case right now. Um, it was. Uh, I know that uh, Chip's family was hoping that she might reveal something to get lesser time, but to my knowledge, as I am recording this, I have no knowledge if she's done that or not. But you should have seen the picture of her when they did find her in California. You never would have recognized her. 
considering the pictures that I had at the time that the episode came out, looked nothing like them. I mean, she is a total meth head. It's it's actually a little bit disgusting. Actually, a, really a little bit disgusting. Um, uh, she's quite a bit younger than I am, but she probably looked 20 years older. It was just, you, I could have passed her on the street the day that that episode came out and I wouldn't have recognized her. So she's now behind bar, bars back here in Florida and has been like that for a while. But Lisa has been, you know, she's been working. She's been talking to people and. Um, some things have come out. She has a couple more names, but that's really all I can say. I, I, uh, I can't. I just can't tell you any more than that. That is a relatively new case, so I'm hopeful that it's going to get solved. But as you know, all, by now, these uh, I guess you'd call them drug cases, where we believe that drugs are probably uh, a part of the disappearance. They're so difficult. You can't believe anybody. Everybody's mind is fried. They misremember things. Addicts are are liars. They're just so tough. So tough. So, uh, you know, I'm hopeful this is a disappearance that happened in 2016, so it's just over two years old. I'm hoping it can get solved, but I just think when drugs are involved, it definitely lengthens the amount of time it takes to solve one of these kinds of cases. We'll just have to see. But that was uh, Chip Campbell's disappearance. The next case I want to talk about is the disappearance of April Pitzer. This was a controversial case because I had some very pointed things. I told you earlier in this episode that I was going to be talking about disappeared and this is where I do that. Disappeared really, really messed up this episode that they did. Now, I will be honest with you, Gloria, um, her mother, who was the guest, I was not entirely thrilled about how I called out Disappeared uh, after, after the interview in that episode. I'll be honest with you. Uh, I'm thinking she wasn't thrilled at all. I wouldn't say that she was angry. She knows that I have a job to do, and we are still friends. Uh, but um, that was probably I, I. I have to admit I wouldn't change a thing. It's just you know the public deserves to know if there's a program out there that can't get the facts right. And that was an episode where they didn't, and I, I felt I had to make known because that disappeared episode is going to continue to play forever. Even if April is found, it's still going to play. And I want people to know the next time they watch it, that they're watching what they're watching. Isn't 100% true. And in fact, they interviewed a couple men in there that they portray as friends and they were not friends of April. In fact, there are two suspects in her disappearance. Glory has kind of uh, fallen off the map a little bit. I haven't been able to contact her. I think she's been going through a lot of health issues and, and other things. But um, before she kind of went out of sight, she claimed that she now knows where April is. Where that is, I have no idea. She has not told me. And even if she told me, I don't know if she'd allow me to tell all of you. All I can tell you is I don't know. But... Months ago, when she was talking about this, until she kind of seemed to fall off of social media, I've not tried to call her anything. Um, she was talking about this. The other issue that transpired was earlier this year, or no, last year after Unfound's episode came out, there was a YouTube channel uh, called, what was it? What's it called? We Explore that covered April's disappearance. To my knowledge, that channel had never covered a disappearance before in its existence. But this guy who does this 
ended up going down to the area where April allegedly disappeared and he was poking around and and he sensationalized the entire he obviously did it just to get viewers I'm saying, well, there's something suspicious over here, and then look at this down here, and we're putting our camera down. You know, look at all these. Th- you can watch it for yourself. Uh, the truth is this. There's, none of, there's no truth to any of it. It was just done for effect. Uh, April Pitzer's disappearance is still unsolved. No matter what that guy said he saw and, you know, tried to portray it like he found things that other people had missed, sensationalized it. He also ended up doing that, once again, I don't know if it was coincidental. This guy does live in Las Vegas. I don't know his name. But he also did a, an episode on Tyler Stice's disappearance. And to my knowledge, he has not done any of Unfound's uh, disappearances since then. Maybe because, once again, he lives in Las Vegas. He can drive down to California for the April Pitzer case. And then all he has to do is drive down to Kingman, which is only an hour and a half, to go to the site where uh, Tyler Stice disappeared. Uh, neither of those episodes should be taken seriously. They are... They are there's quite a bit of, I wouldn't say there's quite a bit of fiction in them, but they certainly portray things not as they are. You could, if you never didn't know anything else about April Pitzer's case and you just happened upon the April Pitzer video that this guy did, that um, you would get the idea that this disappearance, you, you can't understand why it's never been solved and it should be disappeared right at that second. That's the idea that you would get. And we know that's not the case. We know this is a very complex uh, disappearance that people have looked into. Gloria's been out there many times talking to people, and it's still unsolved. There are probably a couple other things that I could say about that uh, case, but a couple updates, but I don't know if I have Gloria's permission to do that because I haven't talked to her in a while. So we'll just leave it leave it at that. Um, it does seem, though, that since Unfound did the disappearance, a lot more people have looked into whether Mr. Wilkinson actually did die in that plane crash. And I will admit that I've had some people contact me to tell me that it's very possible that he didn't. I don't know what to think at this point. But I do believe that he had something to do with April Pitzer's disappearance. At least he knew, if he is deceased now, he knew what happened if he didn't do it himself. And hopefully with that case, as with all of these cases and the ones that aren't getting getting mentioned in this episode, if there are any more updates down the road, I will give you them. The next case... I really debated whether I was going to put this one on the list. All I can tell you is that there are things happening in the Jennifer Wilkerson case. All I can say. If um, this is not a case that I would say is dead or a cold or anything like that. Um, Just some things have popped up. And uh, I, what I, I think I can go on the record on is that um, I was actually in contact with a woman whose boyfriend said that he had run into somebody back at the time that might have had something to do with the disappearance. And I had sent her to show him a couple pictures and unfortunately, this guy died of some disease. I don't know if it's cancer or whatever. This guy actually died. But before he died, he looked at those pictures and said that neither of the people, the guys, is the guy that he was thinking of. Other than that, I can't say any more. But I can tell you that, in a way, uh, 
Jennifer Wilkerson's disappearance uh, it was also a big deal for Unfound because uh, of a connection that I made through that case. Uh, a person who has become a very trusted confidant of mine and can give me a lot of the insight info on law enforcement in the state of Texas, which has been very helpful recently, speaking of which. And this person, I talk to this person, I don't know, maybe once every few weeks about what's going on. So, uh, and I ended up meeting this person, not in person, but I found out about this person during the Jennifer Wilkerson case. Next, Laura Bible and Ashley Freeman. This is the only case that we can say is at least 50% solved. It's the only case that Unfound is covered where we now know who did it, although Laura Bible and Ashley Freeman's remains have still not been found. And actually, now that we know what happened, it really, for the most part, went down like we thought that uh, even though I know that it, at one point I put out the idea, maybe the girls themselves were the target that night. It's now seeming that that, that was not the case. There was a man who was in custody who uh, was there that night. There were actually three men who were involved in what happened that night. They showed up at Danny Freeman's place either to rob him or get money from him for they were involved in drug trade with him. Something happened. They shot him. They killed his wife, executed his wife, bullet to the back of the head. The story is that the two girls ran, ran them down. These guys ran them down, caught them, threw them in the car, burnt the house down, took Laura and Ashley away to another part. Uh, not far away, but not close either. And over the next three days, these guys proceeded to bind them up, torture them, rape them, and then strangle them to death. And one of those men, unfortunately two of the men have died since this happened in 1999. And there was one guy who was still alive, and he was found in prison in Kansas. And as far as the public knows, he um, is not, he says he doesn't know where Laura and Ashley are. He said he, he said he wasn't responsible for that. In fact, of course, he's not taking credit for anything involving this, and he's not going to plead guilty, I don't think. Probably the most important part of giving you this update and this is what I suspect in a lot of disappearances. Is that Laura Bible and Ashley Freeman's Ashley Freeman's disappearances was not as much a mystery as we thought. The fact is there were many people in the Welch, Oklahoma area who knew something. These men had taken picture of Laura Bible and Ashley Freeman while they were tied up and showed these pictures to their girlfriends and friends. And nobody ever said anything. Now the kicker on top of that is that this case should have been probably solved within a couple days. And remember I mentioned back to the Teresa Butler case where we find out all these years later that the cops found her cam camera just a couple days after she disappeared. Well, a piece of information that the public didn't know in the Laura Bible and Ashley Freeman disappearance is that the next day, the cops found an insurance card for a car out on the road by the Freeman residence. Of course, at that point, it had been burned down. The police tracked down the, uh, the owner of the car, had her name on it, and they asked her, how did your insurance card get over by the by the Freeman residence? She goes, you know what? I have no idea. My boyfriend was driving the car. He might have been out that way. Maybe it blew out the window. I don't know. 
Well, this woman's boyfriend actually was one of the three men who did that that night. Murdered all four of these people. That's how close the cops were just a couple days after this disappearance. And they missed it. And this case went unsolved for 19 years. Over 18 years. Almost 19 years. Pretty crazy, right? Pretty crazy. I could not believe it. But that was a piece of information the police have had the whole time. The public never knew about it. At least, I mean, and after this came out, I looked all over the internet to try to find if anybody ever wrote about that. On Reddit, on WebSleuths, you know, all these places where, you know, the theorizing and things tend to get a little out of hand. Nothing. So this is why I continue to remind all of you is just because there's a lot of information out there about disappearances doesn't mean all of the, the information out is out there. And the police are under no obligation to tell us everything. But it certainly, in releasing of that information, certainly doesn't make them look very smart. And I think, you know, I read a timeline of when they started looking at their disappearances more closely again. And I think it coincided with, did a sheriff move out or retire or somebody new came in and they happened to find a box of information about these disappearances that I don't think had been looked at in years. And it was in there that they found this piece of information about the insurance card. The police had the information. But they were that close. They were to the girlfriend of one of the guys that did this. And it should be known, this is one of the girlfriends who knew what did happen. It's uh, hard to believe. It's just hard to believe that the police didn't pick up on this and didn't take it a step further. Oh, your boyfriend, well, where is he? Can we talk to him? Get, you know, where were you then? You know. It's, I think that the connection between this guy and Danny Freeman would have been easy to make. Didn't happen. It's very sad. Troy Galloway. I still talk to his mother, Nancy, once in a while. And she posted on the Troy Galloway page just a couple days ago that she had a recent meeting with the detective who is responsible for the case. I don't know how much came out of that. I only know what I read on the page, so you know as much as I do. But it is good that she is getting meetings like this, and I would urge all of my guests to never go into a meeting like that cold. Make sure you have questions typed up before you get there because once you get there you're going to have like a hundred different things in your head and maybe you won't say any of them it's better to have them typed or written out beforehand the update that I have on this case besides her having this recent conversation is that I had a situation in Troy's case very much like the James Walker case where but in this case it was a friend of Kelsey's Troy's wife who contacted me. This was more recently. This maybe was a month ago, maybe. And this episode came out, when was it? October of 2017. So about nine months ago. A friend of Kelsey's wrote me, and I don't think that she was too pleased. <laughs> uh, it was a very long email. It wasn't, did not have the nasty tone that Ronald Adams did. But she was said, you didn't bring this up. And it was, I think in the end, it was obvious to me that she did not listen to the episode, the, the points that she was making. The truth is, we talked about the problems that Troy had before he disappeared. We talked about him being in the Marines and what happened there. We talked about the drug issues that he had. Um, as I remember, we did talk about Troy and money and what he had done that day before he disappeared. And she brought it up and just kind of obvious to me that uh, if she did listen to it, she wasn't listening. 
you know, you didn't bring up about this and you didn't bring it up about that. And I'm thinking, well, maybe not all of it, but like 95% of it, of what you're commenting there. So I wrote her back and told her that. I never accused her of not listening to it. I didn't say like, how dare you write me without even listening to the episode. I didn't say that. I told her, just told her, yes, we did cover those things. And it was a fairly long email. And as I remember it, uh, then she wrote me back. And what I, you know, I just was not going to get into a long conversation or argument with her. Just was not going to do that. And so, (laughs) this is the funny part of it. So I said, you know what? I'm just going to give you the last word on this. And what I mean by that, anytime I say that to somebody, they can say anything they want. They can F-bomb me or anything. It's just I don't have the time. You know, it's not a constructive conversation. And if I keep egging her on, she's just, if I'm going to keep, if I not egg her on, but just resist her and not give in to her thinking, I know this is just probably going to go on forever. And I just don't have the time for it. It's not constructive. So I just say, Okay, I'm just going to give you the last word. Just say whatever you got to say, and I'm not going to reply. And I do that. I'm pretty good. No matter what somebody says, I'm pretty good at just letting it go when I decide it gets it needs to get to that point. So she had an opportunity to say anything that she could to me. F-bomb me anything. She said three words. You're a joke. <laughs> I'm not kidding. That is the truth. And... I don't know. Um, none of other, uh, no other of Kelsey's friends have contacted me. Uh, I know that Nancy and Kelsey don't, I don't think have a very good relationship for obvious reasons. And you know, no. but that's what happened in that case. And like I said, it was about a month ago, maybe longer than that, that it happened. And uh, it's really, I think the only two, messages that I've gotten trying to defend a suspect. You know, given how many suspects we've called out on Unfound, I would think it would be more, especially given the size of the audience and the way people talk. I would have thought I would have gotten more by this time. That we haven't gotten more kind of tells me that we're on the right track. That there may be tons and tons of people who think exactly like I do or think exactly like you do. And so there's nobody to defend these people. But once in a while, you get like the son of a suspect or friend. uh, And you should know. I mean, on top of that, I told this friend, if Kelsey wants to talk to me about Troy's disappearance, if she has something to say, she could contact me. You found, you know, I'm easy to find. I give out the email address every episode. I have a Facebook group and a Facebook page. I have a private Facebook page. I'm on Twitter. I mean, Instagram. I'm there. You want to contact me? You can find me basically anywhere. I'd love to talk to Kelsey about what went on. And that's a point I maybe I should make right now. If there's any suspect that ever has a problem without about how he or she is represented on this program, they can contact me, okay? I will talk to them. I will be fair, but don't think that they're going to be babied. I'm going to ask tough questions, and if they are not, the the, the, uh, conversations will be on the record, and if I think they're being evasive or lying or something, I will tell my audience that, but I will give them an opportunity to tell their side. And I will tell it objectively to my listeners, but then I will comment on it, but I will give their side. I promise that to anybody. Anybody. So that's what happened in Troy Galloway's case since Unfound covered it. Next one, Patty Action, a disappearance from right here in the Clearwater area, she disappeared, much like Kelly Rothwell, just right up the street from where I live. But in Patty Action's case, we have to go back to the 1970s. I still believe that Patty Action, along with three other women who disappeared in the same time frame, 
I believe, continue to believe to this day that the disappearances are related. I believe that. And I, and I stated that at the time. But what I did manage to do after Patty Action's episode came out, I found the mother of one of the other missing women, young women. And I got to talk to her. And she told me a very interesting story. Now, you should know what I found most interesting, and she was right here once again in the Clearwater, St. Petersburg area. She did not even know about the disappearance of Patty Action and the two other women. So there's four. This is the mother of one of them. She didn't even know about the other three. Had no idea. And I should, you know, I'd like to probably call her back again now that I'm thinking about it. Haven't talked to this woman in a while. Maybe we can make um, an episode out of it, try to connect the two. But she had some interesting things to say about her daughter's disappearance. And then I told her why I thought the two were related. Because uh, if you remember, uh, Patty Action walked out of that hotel and then her car was found somewhere else. Well, the woman I was talking to, her daughter's car was found across the street from where Patty Action disappeared. Yes, really. And so, I, I hard to believe that's a coincidence. Maybe it is. But she had some interesting things to say about her daughter's disappearance. Her daughter was working at a a uh, furniture store during the day. And then uh, I think it was her brother showed up to say hi to her. She was gone. Her car was gone. And there was something knocked over. It just didn't really look like a violent scene or anything, but it, you could tell, well, maybe something happened here. It was kind of weird. And then her car was found later, and that's another unsolved disappearance in Pinellas County where I live. So I hope one of these days to have more time to try to connect all these disappearances, but the program must go on for the cases that I cover every week. So I still believe that Patty Action's disappearance is connected to the disappearance of these three other women, and I got to talk to the mother of one of these other uh, missing women. And that was a very insightful conversation. Uh, I'm not at liberty to discuss that, uh, but she did tell me some interesting things. Other, you know, some guys that uh, her daughter was involved with the time, friends with. And, but I'm just going to leave it at that. And you can find out uh, who those other women are uh, by going, uh, by doing a little search on your own. Let's just put it that way. I don't want to put too much out there about it. But if you do a little searching around, you can find out who the other three women are. The next two cases I want to talk about, and I'm going to do this because I continue to believe that they are related, are the disappearances of Aaron Barnard and Jeremy Burt, both disappearances from Boise, Idaho. If you will remember, and those are the two cases uh, we started 2018 with, for Aaron's disappearance, I spoke with his mother, Vicki, and then the next week, for Jeremy Burt's disappearance, I spoke to a private investigator for the Burt family, Marky Davis. I've talked to both of those women since those episodes came out, and the two of them actually got together, I'm going to say maybe sometime in February, March, and I don't think I'm speaking out of school on this. And I'm happy that they're doing that because, and I think that they've gotten together before, those two cases were on unfound, but uh, because I continue to believe that those two disappearances are related, and once again, how are they related? Just go back and listen to both of the episodes. Uh, I'm glad that Vicki and Marky uh, are working together on them. I think that's a very important part of the process of figuring out what happened to those two men. And those two women working together, I think, will be a more efficient. It'll be more efficient than if they work on their own, even though I think in both cases, on their own, uh, they've done some really, really good work. 
The next case is Rebecca Henderson Polk. I talked to her mother, Janet, quite a bit before she was on the program, and I got to talk to a couple of Rebecca's friends before I did that episode. I think that I mentioned in this my summation after the interview in that episode that one friend was very helpful and the other friend kind of led me on and I finally figured it out. Unfortunately, it took me about an hour to figure it all out. And I do believe that this other friend knows more about Rebecca's disappearance uh, than she was saying. Uh, I'm pretty sure about that. But uh, in Janet and her husband's case, um, just, I'm going to say maybe two months ago, something like that, because I remember where I was when she called me. They had a scammer go after them, and I think that they've had some problems uh, with scammers since the beginning of this disappearance when Rebecca went missing. People trying to convince them of things that aren't true, uh, psychics and people like that. Uh, anybody, if you're new to the program, once again, I would urge you to go back to the beginning and listen to all the episodes, then come back to this. But for anybody new to the program, we don't talk about psychics and palm readers and ghost whispers on Unfound. We just don't do that. I don't believe in them, but it's not even a bias that I bring to the program. Within the missing persons community, people... Once again, like a Kelly Murphy or a Mary Lau, people have been doing this for a long time, raising money, trying to support families. They are considered, those groups of people, ghost whispers, palm readers, psychics, mediums, whatever you want to call them, they're all considered predators. Now, I'm not saying that all of them are lying. I think some of them really do believe that they have special powers. But, as I always say, when they are ready to, ready to give me next Saturday's Powerball numbers and the numbers hit, I'll believe them. Until that point, we don't talk about those types of people on Unfound. So, um, Janet and her husband have, they haven't been victims. I'm not going to say they've been victims, but Janet called me a couple months ago and was asking me about something. And uh, it's always It always puts me in a tough place when I have to tell a guest, Nope, that's a scam. It's not true. I I have to be honest with my guests. I'm always going to be honest with them. I'm not going to withhold anything from them. Um, I'm friends with all of my guests, but that doesn't mean in trying to be their friend that I'm going to hold back on what I think. And I think my guests know that, and I think they respect me for um, being that way. Because I think my perception is that Families either have two types of friends. They have uh, those people who um, are supporting them and everything, but maybe they don't want to say anything that's too over-the-top honest because they're afraid of offending them. So, But they support them. They do. It's real support. But then there's the people who are trying to use them. And I... Um, Of course, I'm not in the using category, but I don't think I'm in the other category either. I'm a reporter. My job is to get the facts out, Um, but I I try to understand what these people are going through, and they need honesty. And I think that um, when I myself or other people, I'm not the only one that's like this, but other people like myself who come along and are just honest with them. They're not looking for anything. Um, They're just telling it the way they see it. I think it's refreshing to these families. I really believe that. And so in Janet's case, when she called me that one night a couple months ago, um, just had to be honest with her, just like I have been since the day we met. Uh, One other point about that episode is somebody ended up emailing me. If you can believe this, this is, you know, this, this is the kind of thing that I think would drive any podcast host nuts. Did that interview. I thought it was a great interview. I think that's a great episode. And what is somebody emailing me about? I got the name of a county wrong. I got some sort of geographical location out of the entire episode. I got a geographical location wrong. Some mistake. I know I looked at it and somehow it just got it wrong. 
and the person says that you should you should check your job before you ever think you're an investigator, you should check that thing out. Now, granted, that was in the summation after I just interviewed Janet Henderson for uh, at least an hour and a half. Great interview. And this is what somebody picks out. You just have to live with those things. The next case on the docket for this program is, and you'll notice, as I said, I've skipped some cases, many cases as a matter of fact. I want to reiterate that just because an episode is left out, you should not infer anything from that. It very well could be that nothing went on or nothing has gone on. It could be that I just can't talk about it, period, which is also very possible. And then it could be a combination of a variety of factors uh, that certain episodes aren't mentioned. And I don't want if guests of those particular episodes um, don't hear their missing loved one mentioned. I hope they don't feel slighted. I'm just going by what I think I know about what happened in those cases, all these cases, since Unfound covered them. It's very well may be that I missed something in looking up all these cases to see what has happened and missed something that was uh, something of important that I probably could have talked about. That is possible. Not very probable, but possible. And I just don't want any of um, the uh, former guests of episodes that aren't mentioned in this particular one to feel slighted. Because every guest should know that when I'm going through my missing persons file and going through the pictures of uh, when I post on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter, wherever, I see every one of these missing people that I've covered. I see their pictures every day, all of them, from Suzanne Lyle right up to this past week in Ellen Sloan. I see every one of their pictures every day. And I make it a point to see their pictures every day. That's truth. That is truth. So the next case is Tiffany Daniels. Not much I can say except to say that there are things going on. Uh, You should know that Cindy and I got to know each other probably as well as any guest that has been on the program because we talked to each other for quite a while before she was actually on the program. That's true. When it when it, did that episode come out? Um, February of this year, February 2018. I think I was talking to her since the summer of 2017. I'd just pop in. How are you doing, Cindy? She was good, working on some things regarding Tiffany's case. And then finally, we were able to get together, and that episode came together, and I continued to talk to her, basically mainly through texting. Uh, since then, I, although I do think that I've talked to her at least once on the phone since Tiffany's episode came out, there are things going on there. She's She is working very, very hard on her daughter's disappearance, and so she keeps me informed. Um, just nothing I can talk about right at this second. The next one is Nicholas Masucci. Fran, uh, there are no updates Of the case, but with Fran Masucci, she is a go getter, as I think you could kind of tell on that episode. Uh, Very energetic, very outgoing, very determined, very focused, um, very disgusted with the current situation of missing persons cases in the United States. So she's trying to do a lot. I think that uh, she's a private business owner, so that gets in the way a little bit of how much she can do, but it seems to me that she's busier during the summer and then maybe business tails off into the fall. And uh, in fact, I just got an email from her recently because I had emailed her uh, about some information. And um, she's working very hard. And I think that... It's she and actually Mary Lau got to meet at the New York Missing Persons Day back in April, and um, I don't think I not, I think I don't think that Mary Lau and and Fran Masucci knew each other before I introduced them, and so they met in person at the New York State Missing Persons Day, 
And Fran, I believe, is going to be a, a force in the missing persons community for many years to come. I really believe that. And I'm happy to know her. And I think she's very happy to know me. And I hope we can meet one of these days because, like I said, I think she's going to be not just concerned with her father's disappearance, but everything that has gone on in New Jersey at least and trying to change the way they investigate missing persons cases, etc. She's going to get some things done. I am pretty sure about it. Renee Yergain, um, that was the first case that Unfound did in the state of Wyoming. I had her brother John on. He and I continue uh, to communicate, and he has kept me updated. And I don't think he would mind me telling all of you that um, it seems between myself and a young woman who has taken a personal interest in the case. Actually, she was the first um, person I talked to about Renee's disappearance. And I thought that she and I would do the interview, and then we worked it out that John would do in the interview, and I think I think that was a great choice. I think she would have been fine too, but John being on the program, being Renee's brother, uh, I think added something to the episode. But he has thanked myself and this young woman uh, for putting the case in the public arena. And he thinks because of the coverage that Unfound gave Renee's case, they are now doing new searches for Renee's uh, remains. Uh, Of course, he believes that her fiancé murdered her. I'm inclined to believe that as well. I do not believe that she ran away. I think it was made to look like that, but I don't believe it. And now there are new searches going on on some land and there are dogs being used, and so there's a, a new, renewed uh, focus on finding her. And John will tell you that that it was unfound, along with this young woman. I don't. I'm not going to mention her name. I don't know if she would want her name mentioned, so I'm going to just keep it off the record. Um, that uh, he gives us the credit for making that happen. I don't live in Wyoming. I've never been to Wyoming, but uh, if it, it was enough just to put that on the map and get people talking about it, and uh, if he could point people in the direction of Unfound and show how important a case his sister's case is, et cetera, then of course I'm happy to do that. And if he thinks that, uh, that Unfound uh, was one of many things that caused these new searches to happen, I couldn't be happier. I could not be happier. I hope that the year gains get the answers they deserve, uh, whether un- Unfound is a part of it or not. I hope they get the answers they deserve. So uh, John throws out that thanks to me. I'm very humbled by that, and I, I deeply appreciate uh, the recognition. Well, now we're to Al Copper, and you can imagine we don't have a lot of cases to go because Al Al's case came out when in April or, or May of 2018, and I'm recording this in July, now night, July 9th. I'm recording this over a couple days. Nothing in particular has gone on in the case, but here's what I think I know. Um, because it's a Western PA case, I have a feeling that uh, my partnership with the Tribune Review in Pittsburgh. And although they've already done a couple stories on it, one in 2013, maybe six months after he disappeared, and then one in 2017, I have a feeling that this is a case in western Pennsylvania that's going to come back to life before this year is over. And I think it's for all of the reasons that were pointed out in that episode. Um, There's just too many weird things. In fact... Um, Being that the Thomas Brown case, I'm recording this on July 9th, a lot of things going on in that case. Of course, I just covered it a few weeks ago. Um, I would almost call Al Copper's case the Thomas Brown case of Pennsylvania. I think there were some shenanigans going on that at least one cop may be involved. Once again, we covered those things, and please listen to that episode again. If you don't re- can't remember what I'm talking about when I mention it, if you haven't listened to it yet, please do. 
But I'm thinking that it's going to get a lot more coverage, a lot more in-depth coverage where some of these people are going to be questioned about what they said back at the time that Al disappeared and then shortly after that, this alleged sighting of him. I think that's going to happen. So although technically there are no updates on that case, I continue to be in contact with his brother, Matt. In fact, I'm going to be going to Pennsylvania tomorrow. I'm driving up there tomorrow. And I anticipate uh, meeting up with Matt for lunch one of those days. I'll just be not far. I mean, he went to, let's just put it this way. He went to Kiskey High School, and my dad taught in the Kiskey Area School District. And uh, I used to live 15 minutes from Kiskey Area High School, even though I went to Leechburg, and although my parents live somewhere else now. Uh, so I will have the ability, he will probably be about 40 minutes away from me, and I'm hoping we can meet up and have lunch and talk. And he and I continue. I would say we talk about once a week or something like that since Elle's case came out. So I would keep your eyes peeled for new de- developments and new um publicity of that case out of western Pennsylvania, technically Avonmore, Pennsylvania, very, very small town. J.R. Mullahan, his wife, Julie, was on the episode, really liked Julie, really liked her uh, from the first time I talked to her. Uh, she and I got along really well. Probably the main point I'd like to make about that episode is that a listener, after the episode came out, clarified how Virginia tolls work. And because during the episode, Julie and I were under the impression that if it was JR or whoever was driving his truck that day and went through the toll and then she got a bill in the mail and we thought, oh, he must have blown the the toll, must have been in a hurry or something like that. That's not the case. Uh, The case is that Um, that's just how tolls work in Virginia, that that was not a fine or anything like that. This is what this, uh, listener clarified. So does that change much? I don't know. I don't know, but, uh, I thought that I needed to correct the record with that. So if you listen to that episode, if you've listened to it already, and we talked about that, um, what we talked about was not accurate. It was wrong. And so I'm trying to fix that now. And if you haven't uh, listened to the episode yet, when we get to that part uh, in the interview, you can just throw out everything that you hear about that particular section. So he didn't, uh, if it was JR or if it wasn't JR, whoever was driving that truck did not blow the toll. Rosemary Rapp, um, that's the next one. We only have a couple more cases to go. And this is going to be an episode that, in, tr- in traditional terms, is pretty average for Unfound going up there to the two-and-a-half-hour mark. But I wanted to be as complete as I could with as many cases that I could. There aren't necessarily any updates regarding that case, but there is going to be a vigil in Ohio while I'm in Pennsylvania, and I hope that I can get to it. I, I-, I can't make any promises Uh, I'm spending time with my parents who don't get to see me much. Even though I have brothers and sister, I am their only son. And so they may have some things planned because I think it's, I think it's in fact, this coming Saturday. So it's only five days from now. We'll see. I'd love to go. Um, But we'll just have to see. So uh, there is a vigil. Um, I'm sure that Rosemary's family is going to be there. I would love to meet them talk to them. Maybe they'd love to meet me too, I guess, probably. Uh, So we'll see uh, if I can make it, but that's going to be... So if you're listening to this, of course, on this Friday, July 13th, Friday the 13th, uh, that vigil, I think, is tomorrow. So we'll see if I can make it. And if I do, I'll tell you about it. Two more cases to go. And the interesting thing about this, and as you would expect, the older the case, the more likely there are going to be updates. For example, like Suzanne Lau's case or uh, Ben Charles Padilla's case, uh, a couple of the cases that started this section. Even we go back to 
uh, the McDaniel sisters from late March or early April of 2017. That's a year and some months since then, and you would expect there to be at least a couple updates uh, in, in those cases that are older. Well, what's so interesting about the next two cases, uh, they are very, very new, with Thomas Brown's coming out on June, I believe, 15th, and then Amanda Fravel's coming out the very next week of June 22nd, and there have been considerable things happening in both of these cases since I did the episodes, if you can believe it. If you can believe it. It's true. Uh, In Thomas Brown's case, because that would be the next one chronologically, I can't even begin to tell you how many people from what would we say, Northern Texas or Western Texas, now are a part of the Unfound Podcast Discussion Group. It seems now when people um, ask to be admitted, it seems uh, 75% of the time they are from Texas. So Unfound's coverage of this disappearance uh, has gotten a lot of traction there, and I continue to work uh, I've contacted a couple media sites, and I don't mean uh, the couple media sites. I guess I would just put it this way. Since Unfound's coverage, there have been two TV stories in Amarillo about Thomas Brown's disappearance. Now, I did not appear on them. I provided video. They both contacted me wanting video, permission to use video of the surveillance uh, that I discovered that is now posted on YouTube. They wanted permission to use that. I said, absolutely. They posted the Unfound's name and gave Unfound credit for those videos. I deeply appreciate that. I think that it really, really means a lot when media companies affiliated with ABC, CBS, NBC, whoever, uh, are willing to give a podcast uh, credit for something. I think that it's considerable, and I think my belief is that more podcasts that are news-oriented which I believe Missing Persons Cases podcasts are, even though I know that many hosts do not put their... If you go to, uh, for example, iTunes, you're going to find many true crime podcasts that aren't in the news and politics category. They're in society and culture. I think that's a mistake. Um, Unfound will always be a news program. That's the way it's classified on Podomatic, on Stitcher, on iTunes, and everywhere. And it, so it meant a lot to me that these uh, media companies would give unfound credit, even if it was just video that was only used for a few seconds. They did not go into the depths of examining the video and explaining it to the listeners. I hope they do do that at some point. But that wasn't done, but that's fine. I think that's coming. I think that's coming. And I think it's going to, I think it's going to be probably done within the next couple months that uh, somebody in Texas is going to be looking at that video and diagramming it and explaining to the listeners why it's such a big deal. The So far, that's not been done. The only place that's been done has been on Unfound and on YouTube where I give descriptions of the videos. There's four of them there, and I splice them down into short clips. Uh, the private investigator, Phil Klein, and... I, I, his partner, a woman, and unfortunately I forget her name right at the second, I apologize, but they've been interviewed. Phil Klein was interviewed on this uh, the radio station that I was on, uh, KXDJ, uh, right before the 4th of July, so about a week ago. Uh, the, the woman that works with him, that's part of that the team, uh, was interviewed by one of the Amarillo TV stations as well. It's like a 20-minute interview. Uh, the Attorney General and investigators have been there, and I continue to get emails from people in Hemp Hill County and elsewhere in northern Texas complaining and having stories about Sheriff Lewis. It's every, I'm telling you, it's every day, and it's multiple messages. Every day, multiple messages. In addition to that, I have a contact in Texas that is working on a couple angles for me, maybe to even 
get more coverage and not just uh, in, a, in a city like Amarillo, but maybe in some of the bigger cities in Texas, if not the entire state. We're working on that. And I inform Penny, I can't talk about that. I don't feel comfortable talking about that right at the second, but Penny surely knows everything that I've been doing. She knows who I've been talking to, and I'm continuing to work on that for her to get more media coverage. And I, and it doesn't, I do not care if I get interviewed or not. I don't care. I don't care. What's most important to me is that the story gets out there, that Penny gets interviewed and tells the story that, about what she knows, and then also that the videos get their due uh, coverage and somebody explains to the, the viewers what is actually going on and why it's so important. And I think that, once again, as I said before, I think that's going to happen. It's going to happen. And it, what's interesting is I explained uh, this past week, and I explained the whole case to my brother Brian, you know, everything that I could. Uh, we went to lunch between my uh, disc golf rounds. I did not play ve very well this past weekend, but uh, we went to lunch between rounds, and I was explaining the case to him, and he caught on to it very quickly, what was going on. And he feels very much the way all of you do about the case. And so... There's a lot going on in the case, even since Unfound just covered the case three weeks ago. There's been multiple interviews by the by the uh, investigator, and, uh, the private investigator, and others. Penny has been interviewed. There's been two TV stories on Amarillo stations, and I'm believing that KXDJ in uh, what is it, where is it Perryton uh, continues to you know, everyday coverage of the disappearance as well, even if they aren't interviewing somebody. And you should know that I've talked to Chris Samples, the guy who interviewed me on KXDJ, the same guy who interviewed Phil Klein uh, a couple times. And um, we're in contact with each other, and he would like to have me on the program sometime in the future. Whenever that is, is fine with me. If it's next week, it's next week. If it's four months from now, that's fine too. If he wants to have me on the program... Uh, that's great. I'm not asking for it, but if he wants to have me on there to maybe further explain the videos, being that that's now, I guess, my part of the case, the my little small part of the contribution to the whole, then we could talk about that. And I'd also probably like to talk to him uh, about missing persons cases in general uh, because um, I try to educate anybody that I can. I'll just put it that way. So a lot going on in Thomas Brown's case. Uh, the the downloads for Unfounder are up. I mean, they've been going up. They go up every month anyway. But uh, this case in particular has uh, seen a drastic increase, caused a drastic increase in people looking at Unfound because of the different outlets, once again, from the videos in Amarillo, from the radio station, even when... Uh, the private investigator and the woman who works with him have been interviewed. Unfound has come up. That certainly adds to the visibility of Unfound, and it shows in the stats. It really, really shows. So finally, we will go to Amanda Fravel, the most, re uh, the most recent case that I'm going to talk about uh, on this episode, this update episode. First thing I'd like to mention is that a listener who is a pretty good investigator behind the scenes, I'm not going to say her name, has taken upon herself to start an Amanda Fravel page on Facebook. And I hope that you will go there and like, share, follow it, get the notifications, because there hasn't there wasn't an Amanda Fravel page until Unfound covered the case, and this listener said, Yeah, I can do that. I'm gonna do that. And she's very interested in the case in addition to that. We'll talk about that in a moment. But she is doing that with Melissa, Amanda's sister. And already there have been a lot of pictures posted up there that I'd never seen of Amanda before. So I'm glad those pictures are getting posted. Some of them are very funny. I think one of them was Amanda whipping the finger at the camera, which is kind of funny. And it really shows a uh, good uh, the personality. They had very fun-loving personality, obviously. 
And uh, I hope you will check that page out. And I continued to talk to uh, Melissa uh, about the page. Now, also, in addition to the page, there have been a couple of listeners who have been trying to track Lou Frank down. And I can tell you, without getting into too many details, and I want you to know I've had very, very little to do with this. This is all the listeners doing the work. They listen to the episode. They get involved. I love it. I absolutely love it. And so I'm not going to take any credit for any of this, okay, except for doing the episode. That's what I did. Uh, But um, they've come to me. They ask me uh, what I think about this or that. And let's just say that they're narrowing the Lou Franks out there down. And doing a lot of really, really good work. I mean, really, really good work. So proud of them. And I happen to believe if it continues on this path, I think that we're going to eventually track down who Lou Frank uh, is or was. I'm conflicted in believing whether he is alive or deceased now because there's a couple, two, at least two good candidates right now. And that's really about all I can say. And uh, let's just say that Lou Frank uh, might not have been, it might have been his real name, but it wasn't his complete name. Let's just put it that way. So a lot has been done on that case, even though that case was just covered on June 22nd, uh, three weeks ago. You know, less than three weeks ago. And uh, Melissa, and of course I mentioned Amanda's uh, Tom, who ended up marrying Amanda's mother. He, he was married to her when she dis, uh, when Amanda disappeared, but I think they're divorced now, but I call him like Uncle Tom. Um, and um, they call him Uncle, Uncle Tom, I guess. And so that's what I've started to call him. And I've talked to him a couple times on the phone. They are, Melissa and he are fully aware of what's going on. They are 100% aware. And um, they will continue to be updated, uh, and I think they're going to be a lot of help because, at least in Tom's case, he actually lo- saw Lou Frank. He was in his presence, talked to him, and then I think that's going to be helpful at some point because I think that these uh, these people who are working at this, I think they're going to be successful eventually. I can't guarantee anything tom- today or tomorrow or the next day, but... W- they're a lot, we're a lot closer, and they're a lot closer, I should say, than we were a few weeks ago before the Unfound episode came out. And I'm so proud of those listeners to get involved, just doing such great work. And, just, and once again, I'm not taking credit for any of it. And should Lou Frank be found uh, the right guy, even if it doesn't necessarily lead to all the answers that we want, I think from there we may have to go in a couple different directions. But as far as all that, I'm going to continue to give them all the credit, and I don't mind doing so. You know, I was going to f- finish with Amanda Fravel, but in talking about Amanda Fravel, I, I think that I have to mention Julie Early's case because something similar is going on there, at least with a Facebook page. Julie Early's uh, disappearance did not have a Facebook page. And because of Unfound's coverage, once again, another listener has decided to start a page, once again, working, I believe, I hope she is, working with Kim Willie to make that happen and getting pictures posted up. And we know how starting a page like that can so can raise the profile of a disappearance a lot faster than many things can. So I'm happy to say that because of Unfound's coverage, a listener has come forward and said, yeah, I can do that. I can work. I can do that. Love to do that for Kim and Julie's family. So that's happening. So that's an update on that case. Was I don't have it on my list, but then I said, oh, yeah, I, I need to include that. So that's exciting. Once again, it's just something simple as that. You never know where it can go. And uh, it's not a solution to the case. Uh, of course, in that case, that doesn't mean that Julie Early's uh, husband is going to come forward. Craig is going to suddenly come forward and confess or anything like that. But it's something. 
it, and it's better than nothing. And, you know, with uh, an unfound page, you can do so much with it. You can market it. You can promote it. Uh, and that's a lot of times how, frankly, how local media companies, local TV stations, newspapers, whatever, that's how they find disappearances to talk about. They go to Facebook and see if there are any pages for disappearances in their area. That's how it happens. I know that for a fact. So I'm really happy that a listener got involved in Julie Early's case as well. So happy. And that is the end of the updates, and I'm going to have a little bit of a summation here in a moment. Before that, though, I want to make sure that all of the missing persons who have been covered on Unfound get mentioned in this episode. So I don't know what you're doing right now, if you're on a treadmill or in your car or whatever. I hope you'll take a moment to listen to each of these names, where they disappeared from, and the date of that disappearance. Once again, this will be in chronological order. Suzanne Lyle, Albany, New York, March 2nd, 1998. Jason Jolkowski, Omaha, Nebraska, June 13th, 2001. Jesse Foster, North Las Vegas, Nevada, March 28th, 2006. Rosemary Gayhart, Cape Coral, Florida, March 14th, 1985. Ben Charles Padilla, Luanda, Angola, May 25th, 2003. Kelly Rothwell, Indian Rocks Beach, Florida, March 12th, 2011. Joshua Guimond, Collegeville, Minnesota, November 9th, 2002. Donnie Smatlack, North Versailles, Pennsylvania, January 28th, 2006. Andrea Bowman, Hamilton, Michigan, March 11th, 1989. Robin Abrams, Beecher, Illinois, October 4th, 1990. Regina Marie Boss, Lincoln, Nebraska, October 16th, 2000. Christopher Hyde, Bradenton, Florida, June 25th, 2003. Jeff Nichols, Salt Lake City, Utah, June 8th, 2004. Rebecca Gary, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, December 27th, 1988. James Walker, Thaxton, Virginia, April 7th, 2000. Teresa Butler, Risco, Missouri, January 24th, 2006. Charlotte Paulus, Gerard, Ohio, March 11th, 1994. Kathy Fry, Greenwood, Indiana, November 13th, 1993. Eric Franks, Saginaw, Michigan, March 21st, 2011. Jeff Joseph, Humboldt County, California, June 21st, 2014. Donna Michalenko, Butte, North Dakota, November 2nd, 1968. Dave Madot, Kent Monroe, and Omar Shearer, Gulf of Mexico, Florida, November 4th, 1994. Claudia Wells, Maryville, Illinois, January 1995. Peggy and Patty McDaniel, Lauder Hill, Florida, September 15th, 1979. Shannon Turner, Indianapolis, Indiana, December 4th, 1997. Brandy Wells, Longview, Texas, August 2nd, 2006. Clashindra Hall, Pine Bluff, Arkansas, May 9th, 1994. Ronnie Russell, Batesville, Arkansas, November 4th, 2010. Esther Westenbarger, Kokomo, Indiana, November 12th, 2009. Shane Fell, Harvey, Louisiana, June 10th, 2011. 
Ashley Eifert, Harahan, Louisiana, January 9, 2003. Brandon Williams, Nashville, Tennessee, May 18, 2013. Craig Freer, Scotia, New York, June 27, 2004. Pam Golden, Little Rock, Arkansas, July 22, 1993. Chip Campbell, Milton, Florida, March 8, 2016. Amanda DeGuio, Upper Darby Township, Pennsylvania, June 3, 2014. April Pitzer, Newberry Springs, California, June 28, 2004. Jennifer Wilkerson, Lubbock, Texas, July 12, 2004. Kent Jacobs, Hope Mills, North Carolina, March 10, 2002. Aaron Gilbert, Girdwood, Alaska, July 1, 1995. Tammy Leppert, Rock Ledge, Florida, July 6, 1983. Crystal Morrison, Concord, North Carolina, August 23, 2012. Chris Turner, Las Vegas, Nevada, August 5, 2016. Linda Carroll, Crestview, Florida, September 25, 1984. Nikki McCown, Richmond, Indiana, July 22, 2001. Helen Diamond, Tilden Township, Michigan, June 28, 1981. Laura Bible and Ashley Freeman, Welch, Oklahoma, December 30, 1999. Lucinda Hules, Tampa, Florida, October 27, 1984. Ashley Kohler, Corona, California, August of 2007. Debbie Lowe, Pompano Beach, Florida, February 29, 1972. Patrick Beavers, Jerome, Idaho, April 3, 1997. Clinton Nelson, Princeton, Louisiana, September 1, 2006. Troy Galloway, Sonora, California, January 13, 2016. Patty Action, Clearwater, Florida, May 26, 1978. Danielle Bell, Pensacola, Florida, September 28, 2001. Evelyn Hartley, La Crosse, Wisconsin, October 24, 1953. Dal Phillips, Helenwood, Tennessee, December 5, 2012. Tyler Stice, Kingman, Arizona, June 22, 2016. Bill Underhill, Minneapolis, Minnesota, March 2, 1969. Patty Taylor, Tulsa, Oklahoma, August 31, 1981. Aaron Barnard, Boise, Idaho, December 4, 2004. Jeremy Burt, Boise, Idaho, February 11, 2007. Brian Sullivan, Rochester, New York, July 7, 2007. Nikki Wells, Detroit, Michigan, August 6, 2012. Marina Bolter, Bloomfield, Indiana, December 31, 2014. Mandy Stokes, Oakland, California, November 25, 2007. Greg Brooks, Castleberry, Florida, January 18, 2000. Rebecca Henderson Polk, Why Not Mississippi, September 6, 2015. Dominic Holly Grisham, Rochester, New York, February 12, 2009. Tiffany Daniels, Pensacola, Florida, August 12, 2013. Nicholas Masucci, Kearney, New Jersey, September 18, 
1974. Donald Irwin, Camden Tin, Missouri, December 29, 2013. Billy D. Silvestro, Hamilton, Ohio, February 7, 2011. Renee Yergain, Torrington, Wyoming, August 10, 2004. Mikkel Biggs, Mesa, Arizona, January 2, 1999. Al Copper, Avonmore, Pennsylvania, June 6, 2013. J.R. Mullahan, Norfolk, Virginia, August 3, 2015. Jamie Bowen, Columbus, Ohio, April 10, 2014. Travis Robertson, Fayetteville, Arkansas, February 28, 2006. Rosemary Rapp, Salineville, Ohio, June 10, 2016. Kristen Modafferi, San Francisco, California, June 23, 1997. Zoe Campos, Lubbock, Texas, November 17, 2013. Sean Guignard, Thompson, Manitoba, November 28, 2015. Thomas Brown, Canadian, Texas, November 23, 2016. Amanda Fravel, Las Vegas, Nevada, June 13, 1986. Julie Early, Trotwood, Ohio, May 21, 2012. And Ellen Sloan, Polson, Montana, April 15, 2005. I hope the listeners of Unfound will keep these people and all of their family members and friends in their thoughts and prayers. I have to admit that I really didn't even think about doing this episode until I had so many listeners wanting to know what happened here and what happened there with this case or that case. And I promise that it doesn't take almost a hundred episodes before I do one again. Uh, You can expect probably about this time next year if all things go well within uh, the next 12 months, and I think that they will go very well, that I will do another update episode. And once again, we'll start at the beginning with Suzanne Lyle and work our way up to the present with whoever the last case is in that time period. So don't expect me to wait almost two years to do one of these episodes again. And I want to thank uh, those listeners who suggested this kind of episode Um Thank you for the suggestion, and I hope that this episode met your expectations. I just hope that the next time we all get together for this kind of episode, that we have more results to talk about, being that this episode started with the topic of results. I hope that some of these people are found, and if they aren't with us anymore, I hope that their remains are found, and we know Uh, what happened to them, and if it was um, foul play involved, that those people responsible are in custody. That's what I hope for the next time that I do an episode like this. And that's the program. If you found it informative, please go to the app that you use to listen to Unfound and give this podcast a great review. I thank you for listening. I'm Ed Denzel, and you've been listening to Unfound.